Ladies and gentlemen, I've been away from the internet for around a month now, and it's kind of strange how much can happen within a month. This thing can become... Uh, th this thing? I'm not actually sure why this thing has become this thing. What? What? <laughs> Why did you do that? But aside from egotistical billionaires who just have nothing better to do with their time, um, yeah, also things on the internet can change within a month. Pretty much, well, absolutely everything. Your favourite streamers, well, I say favourite, I, I mean that with a pinch of, pinch of a jar of salt. Uh, your, some streamers can go to war with big YouTubers, and just in general, the social media space can become an absolute war zone, and absolutely everything can change in an instant. Which, you know, isn't really good for somebody that left the internet for a month whilst having a career which involves, well, covering pretty much every single thing that happens on the internet. But ignoring the fact that I'm terrible at my job, there have been some things that I have noticed in my absence that aren't to do with YouTube versus streamers or some form of internet civil war. It's to do with some very dark and mysterious and strange things that I've noticed ongoing in the media and behind the scenes. I think what we're going to be talking about today represents an ongoing issue when it comes to social media, but also just in general in the world of Hollywood and famous and rich people. It's not like what we're going to be speaking about today is anything new, but it's genuinely quite shocking to see where some influencers are currently at in their journey on this platform. And yeah, as somebody that does cover things that happen in the internet, it honestly is pretty rare for me to be shocked by a situation. I mean, I've covered pretty much every single little thing, but this, ladies and gentlemen, this is just really, really weird. Certain influencers are now using the media in order to try and sway the public opinion about them back to being positive from negative. Certain influencers are now hiring some of the most notorious lawyers in the world who have some of the most controversial figures on their books. And every single day, more and more things leak throughout social media and behind the scenes about certain influencers. And I don't really know why I'm being so mysterious about who I'm speaking about. Obviously, I'm speaking about Colleen Ballinger. Yes, this is the conclusion to the trilogy of videos that I've made about this situation. Yes, this thing has been going on for way too long. And yes, I am going to speak about something else in my next video. But I needed to make this video because things have changed. Things have actually gotten far worse than we actually realize. And this whole situation is going to a new ground which I don't really think we have seen on social media. Because it's now been a month since this whole Colleen situation seemingly wrapped up, where Colleen faced a plethora of public allegations, public scrutiny, a public downfall, which of course led to a public apology. <laughs> But I'm here to tell you that the actual situation, yes, it has changed. It's, it's gone rogue. It's gone different. It's gone behind the scenes. Because Colleen Ballinger's strategy has clearly changed since a month ago. It's clear that Colleen is aware that what she was doing back then was not going to help her case in any way, shape, or form. But to be honest with you, I don't think you really needed two three-hour documentaries to tell you that, yes, playing this instrument in response to serious allegations it's obviously I can't even play it how do you play this thing with one hand it's not gonna really help it's not gonna help so let's get in to yes the part three the conclusion to the Colleen Ballinger situation where things are even worse Now, firstly, you beautiful bastards, I must start this part of the video by saying that, yes, we are now about to go over some things that we may have actually briefly gone over in my previous two videos because we need to big, big, build a bigger picture. There is lots of new information that we're going to go over, but that new information can be attributed to the old information to kind of get a bigger understanding to what is actually going on in this crazy situation. Because originally the picture that we're building was a YouTuber scandal like Dramageddon, like something which we had seen before, but now it's becoming sneaky. Now the picture is a picture of of, of defamation, and that, that, that's not a good analogy in any way, or just a good way to describe it, pretty much, defamation lawsuits are coming into things, and ladies and gentlemen, as somebody that is a YouTuber that makes videos about things on the internet, I can just say to you, that when I hear the word defamation, it's kind of like when people in Harry Potter hear Voldemort's name, 
Uh, sorry, it's whisk. That was a really bad joke. Why did I do that? It's kind of, you know, it's kind of when people hear Voldemort and they get really scared because when I hear defamation, I start to get flashbacks. I start to get the chills because defamation lawsuits typically mean being silenced and possibly being forced into paying thousands upon thousands of dollars to a now, the actual definition of defamation is defamation is a false statement presented as fact that causes injury or damage to the character of the person that it is about. An example of this is Tom Smith stole money from his employer, and if this is untrue and if this statement damages Tom's reputation or ability to work, it is defamation and yeah i think that suing somebody for defamation is a good thing i think if somebody does truly slander somebody's name and lie about somebody to tarnish their reputation i think that somebody should be able to get repercussions for that they should be able to get uh, compensation but the problem is the defamation lawsuits used in this world in the modern day especially in social media typically aren't all about justice because as somebody that has received multiple defamation lawsuit threats in my time I, I can pretty happily say that in every single case of that i did not lie about that person i solely stuck to the truth i solely stuck to just giving opinions which weren't factual based and if i was going through the facts i believe that in most cases if not every case the facts were 100 accurate and if they were not accurate i either deleted that video and retracted my statement or well actually no there isn't another example of this because i have not actually been successfully sued for defamation because yes, I have not actually done defamation. But the problem is, ladies and gentlemen, is when you receive one of these threats in the post or in your email, I, I don't know why I said post. Who still receives post? Well, everybody, but it's just not really the modern method of sending defamation lawsuits. Basically, when you receive a threat of a defamation lawsuit in your email, you usually just shit your pants. You usually just think, wow, I could be playing a lot of money here if I get involved in this legal case. Because the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, even if you win your case, you still need to go to court. You still need to back all this thing out and that still costs thousands upon thousands of, of pounds or dollars wherever you're from or uh, didgeridoos if you're from Australia or something like that. Basically, the whole process will no doubt cost you money and mental strain. A defamation lawsuit can be a very lengthy process. So usually, defamation lawsuit threats don't actually go anywhere. It is just a method of silencing a lot of people. Of course, not in every single situation, but when it comes to social media, and people giving their opinions being threatened by these types of lawsuits, it typically just is a silencing tactic. And the best example I can give you this is the main defamation lawsuit threat that I have personally received is from this guy. Yes, Onision. Now, ladies and gentlemen, do you think I defamed this bloke? Yeah, 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 I'm not even going to ask you to answer that. Just, yeah, yeah, you, you, come, come on. But despite knowing that I obviously would win the case, and despite knowing I had done absolutely nothing wrong, it was still absolutely shriveled to think that if this actually did go to court, it was this long, lengthy process, it would have cost me thousands and absolutely damaged my mental health and probably damaged my business because I would have been too stressed to work. And now I know what you're wondering. Well, what does this have to do with Colleen Ballinger. Well, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to Colleen Ballinger's legal representatives. Andrew lawyer who, according to his own LinkedIn, seemingly works in entertainment, legislation, media, privacy rights, and keyword here, defamation, and also employment law. And as you can see, in multiple articles, he has been referenced, the firm he works for has been referenced, when it comes to Colleen Ballinger's legal representatives. And now I'm not going to criticize Colleen's actual representatives, they are just lawyers doing their job. They can't help the fact that Colleen Ballinger has hired them, but I am going to speak about the fact that Colleen has hired this legal firm. Now, it is unknown when the hiring actually took place, but it's very clear to me that this firm is obviously involved in defamation. You only have to look closely at their client list to kind of get an understanding at that, and we will look into those clients because that is a very important part here. But yes, it's very clear that this is now the new Colleen Ballinger process when it comes to responding to things now. Rather than Colleen 
Jane herself actually coming out in a video and saying, oh, I didn't do this, or oh, I didn't do that, now Colleen is just doing the old-fashioned Hollywood route of relying on a legal team, a big scary legal team, to take the action for her. And rather than clearing her name in the eyes of the social media world, she is now just going to seemingly try to silence people. And I think that's shown right here, when H3H3, a content creator that regularly speaks about Colleen, was sent a cease and desist from Colleen's legal representatives. And I understand that a lot of people will be saying, oh, well, if they lied about it, then surely they should face the repercussions. Fraser, you said that like five minutes ago. If somebody slanders somebody, there should be repercussions. And, and I do agree, but the problem is, is that this legal team are very select with what they actually respond with. So far, the legal team has come out to represent and speak for Colleen in all of these situations right here. And as you can see, these things, the copyright issues, uh, they're not really that major. Nobody is saying that Colleen Ballinger should be in jail because of these copyright issues. People are saying that she should be in jail for the stuff to do with Trisha Paytas and Adam McIntyre. But the legal team are not responding to that. And it seems to me that Colleen is very clearly going down, as I said previously, the Hollywood route. Rather than speaking about the major things like she has actually done in the past, whether it was terrible done or not, she is now changing up the way she responds to things by being smart about it, by using a team of people that know what they're doing. And in the sense of PR, yes, that does absolutely make sense. But think about this for a second. I have not received a cease and desist for speaking about the very severe allegations about Colleen. In fact, I don't think many people have, but people are clearly receiving cease and desists for speaking about minor things. To me, that is a little admission of guilt in my personal opinion, and it makes this whole tactic with this legal team seem even more suspicious and just outright wrong. If Colleen really wanted to prove things to be false, she could come out and speak about them, but she knows if she does that, she will be called out for not only her lies, but ignoring things. If Colleen randomly made a statement saying, oh, I, I, I didn't copyright strike people, people obviously be like, well, what about all of these other million things? And Colleen would put herself into a corner. But by using the legal team, it's very sneaky and it works. And it is absolutely something that happens in Hollywood. But it is absolutely terrifying to see that this is going down that path. But the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, I don't even think that this is a justice thing. I think that this is a fear thing, a silencing thing. Colleen is now using very expensive lawyers to go around and do her dirty business. And I think the reason that she is doing that is because every single time Colleen has responded publicly by herself in the past, it has failed miserably. So now she has turned to this team to not just install fear, but apply their own methods and tactics into publicly reforming somebody that is seen as a bad person by the community on YouTube and just in general, the entire world. And if you don't believe me on this, well, let's just take a look at the clients that Colleen's representatives also represents. Chief is not getting paid this week. Oh my god, I'm feeling so homosexual right now! Firstly on the list, ladies and gentlemen, we have Army Hammer, accused of, well, uh... All of these things, yes, everything here is what this man has been accused of. And ladies and gentlemen, if there's one thing I know about Army Hammer, is this guy does not have a very good public reputation. Now, of course, what this man was accused of is obviously a lot worse than what Colleen has been accused of, but this man obviously has a horrible reputation, and defamation lawyers who can send any form of cease and desist letter that they want at any time will probably help a lot in this situation. Army Hammer is a person in a position of power, somebody with lots of wealth, somebody that can use his money to implement his will on other people speaking up against him. Regardless of if what out there is said about him is true or not, that doesn't even matter if you have money. The amount of times I have seen somebody who is clearly a victim get silenced because somebody has more money than them is absolutely obscene. But ladies and gentlemen, this is just the beginning of the list. Secondly, we have Brian Singer, who is somebody accused of, well, 
all these terrible things. And, and, and yes, this is another person, it's becoming a bit of a pattern, with a tarnished reputation in the eyes of the public, but it doesn't end there. The next one is Danny Maidstone, accused of all of these things. And then we have Bill Cosby, accused of all of this. And ladies and gentlemen, what is the pattern coming on here? Of course it is. Bill Cosby also has a terrible public reputation. But then, ladies and gentlemen, to top it all off, Colleen Ballinger's legal representatives also represented it. I can't actually say that word correctly, but they represented... I I don't know if I can say it because it's just so obscene that these worlds are clashing. Prince Andrew. And I did just shout that out loudly and I think that my neighbors are probably a little bit confused right now. Yes, Prince Andrew. Uh, oh, I don't even know if I can even show these things. This yeah, it it's not good. And if there's one thing I know about Prince Andrew, it's the bloke doesn't have a very good reputation. Not a good reputation whatsoever. But what I will say about that is with this legal team, Prince Andrew will definitely not be sweating. And of course I know what some people will say. Well, all of these people are just hiring the best people at their job. Yes, these people all have terrible reputations, so they're not going to go and sign a lawyer who, who specializes in tax. They're going to sign a lawyer who specializes in defamation and recovering somebody's tarnished reputation. And whilst I do absolutely agree that it's the logical mindset, I think it's just a little bit absurd that Colleen Ballinger is now being thrown into the group of people like Bill Cosby, <laughs> Brian Singer and Prince Andrew. It's, it's, is, is that not a little bit telling? Like, am, am I just reaching here? Or No, I'm not. I, 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 I'm not. Obviously, Colleen knows what she is doing here. She is signing the best of the best to recover her reputation. But the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, in the year of 2023, when somebody uses a defamation lawyer, in particular when it comes to people like Bill Cosby and, and other people who we've mentioned, we all know that that is usually a silencing method, in my opinion. I should just say for defamation reasons, this whole video is just my opinion and not based on fact. But yes, I think for the most part in 2023, after the years of the Me Too movement, we now know that when it comes to defamation lawyers being used to come after people that speak against their alleged abusers, that is usually a silencing method. I don't know how many times I need to say it. So yes, this isn't very good on Colleen, and this is now going into such dark and depressing realms. Because in the past, when a YouTuber is accused of things, they typically respond on their YouTube channel. But when it doesn't work, they either just continuously go back to uploading or they just leave the internet in general. But this is now becoming a much darker and sinister thing. And it is genuinely worrying me what this is now setting in terms of a precedent on this platform. You can say I'm reaching, but the best part about YouTube is being able to come on here and broadcast yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, it was literally the slogan for like three years until, you know, they implemented the terms of service and they realized, oh, broadcasting every Thing, it's probably not good for advertisers, but yes, it was the original slogan, and I think what Colleen could do if she genuinely was innocent and had the receipts to prove it is come onto her platform, not play a ukulele, not give a drum solo, and just tell the truth. But now, instead of that, she is relying on Prince Andrew's lawyer. I don't know about you, but to me, that just does not represent an innocent conscience. But my friends, it only gets even worse when you actually start to dig a little bit deeper and look into this legal representative of Colleen Ballinger. Because from a few Google searches, I found some rather disturbing things where it clearly shows that her legal representative is clearly somebody that has spoken in a negative sense about the Me Too movement. Starting off with quotes such as, public allegations of essay or similar misconduct, especially since the dawn of the Me Too era, are 
very powerful. Defending those who have been publicly accused of such wrongdoing has become harder because of the fundamental notion of innocent until proven guilty being turned on its head. Now, personally, I don't think that's why it's harder to prove these celebrities being innocent nowadays. I think it's mainly because people are being braver. People realize, especially in the social media age, that people will stand by accusers. They will support people who speak up against their alleged abusers. And I think that does come from this world that we are now living in, where we have technology, social media, being able to record things, screenshot things, so much being done over the internet. It's far easier to catch people out. But just in general, I think public opinions have now changed when it comes to people in Hollywood being accused of things or just famous people in general. I think nowadays people do look at a lot of Hollywood actors with very negative opinions because it is very clear that a lot of famous people have taken advantage of their power, abused that power, and abused individuals. It's very clear before the internet it was so much easier for these people to get away with things, silence people, but now because of the power of the internet that is harder and harder to do. I don't think it's because the Me Too movement is a bad thing, I think it's just because social media is a very powerful tool, but I think this opening quote is a, a little bit of a teaser to what this representative actually believes. For example, quotes such as, there is an assumption of wrongdoing just based on an accusation, even an anonymous one, to me, it's very clear what this guy believes, and I think that's incredibly worrying that this guy is now being hired by Colleen Ballinger, somebody that for years has presented themselves to be this wonderful human being is now being represented by this guy and obviously it is his job but I, I, I feel like I can have my personal opinion about the people you represent and I've probably contradicted something I said earlier but when you just look into these quotes to me personally it just seems very victim blamey. For example he has called people like Brian Singer's accused as paranoid, delusional and needy saying other people have paranoid delusions. Even if he doesn't actually believe that these accusers are speaking the truth, I feel like these are very disgusting statements to make, but it doesn't end there. When going to the Prince Andrew case, he accused people of just looking for another payday and other disgusting things like this. It is just horrible to read, but I think it is a perfect representative of who Colleen Ballinger has actually hired here. With him saying things like allegations are just as bad and damaging as a conviction, it's very clear and evident what this guy truly believes about the Me Too movement, and it is really sickening to be honest with you. But then we slowly get into the method behind the madness of this legal team because you can see all of these horrible quotes and you can build an opinion for yourself but when you look even further into the quotes you can actually get a bit of understanding of what this legal team are telling Colleen Ballinger to do right now. As you can see here it says that the representative says in some cases the best response may just be to lie low. Some Sometimes the best defense is to not do anything, is to accept the punishment or whatever decision is that the company made and stay quiet and better yourself as a person. Make whatever apologies need to be made privately. It's very clear that this is what Killeen Ballinger is doing right now. Yes, I think she will eventually come out of a statement and we will get into that later in this video, but it's very clear to me personally that this legal representative has told Killeen Ballinger to lay quiet. They'll handle a lot of the stuff going on and Colleen Ballinger will just lay low, probably do some things behind the scenes. And to me, that is so disingenuine, but it is exactly why she has hired these lawyers. And at this point, I feel like Colleen has only three options. Option number one, she uploads a video where she comes clean about everything, explains everything, whether you agree with her or not. I think that truly is the most respectable option and that is saying something in terms of respect. It would be the most minute level of respect, but it would be far better than the next two options. Option number two would just be to leave the internet and never say anything again. And personally, I don't agree with this. I don't think it's fair when it comes to the victims. I don't think it's fair on anybody. And I doubt that this is actually going to happen because Colleen has an empire. Whether it's been tainted completely and utterly destroyed, she does have a lot of followers and that means a lot of money. I'm sure she's not going to give up on it, and that's why I think option three is the thing that's actually
actually going to happen. I think currently Colleen's team are building a case. They're trying to get everything that they can possibly get together to make at least 20% of her audience like her again. For example, Shane Dawson, he didn't do this, but he did actually manage to salvage like 10% of his audience and he is still getting a million views or if not a bit more than that every single video and I think that's what Colleen Ballinger is going to do. I think she's going to put out a video which most people don't like but I think some people will actually agree with it and stick by Colleen and watch her videos and whilst that will be a massive financial hit it will be much better for her than just outright abandoning her platforms which she has spent years building. Personally I am actually just shocked that it took this long for Colleen Ballinger to actually develop a, a plan that could actually possibly recover her career to some extent. The fact that we had to go through the ukulele video and all the other stuff in the last three years is absolutely insane to me. And it truly does just show how probably egotistical this person is. Colleen probably thought that she would be able to just get through everything like she has done in the past, manipulate the situations, and go away from all of the controversy. But obviously that has not happened. And now the legal team are here to try and change things. It's clear that some tactics have been applied that we have spoken about. It's clear that rather than responding to the actual major things out there, such as these horrible allegations, the legal team will now just respond to the things that are very minute, not as actually damning, and things that they probably can prove wrong. There is a reason that this legal team have not publicly responded to these very serious allegations and outright denied them. If they could have done that already, they would have. If Colleen Ballinger could have put out a video where she publicly makes herself look 100% in the clear, she would have absolutely done that. The fact that Colleen Ballinger is now relying on these lawyers is absolutely wild to me because personally, I now just see this as, in my opinion, an admittance of guilt. Given how, as we've seen through every single expose in this situation, how things keep on getting worse and worse, everything has been screenshotted. It's clear that everything was happening online, and Colleen herself probably has screenshots, yet she still has not come out and disproved anything. Ultimately, as a YouTuber, I can't personally help but feel whenever I see a defamation lawyer being involved in something YouTube related or social media related, I just can't help but have negative connotations in my brain. Why does the YouTuber whose entire career built up on, you know, broadcasting yourself, putting up videos about you, being you on the internet, why can that YouTuber, when they're em embroiled in controversy, then not do the same thing of posting a video of themselves where they actually be genuine and tell the truth. To me personally, the whole thing is a very strategic move and it is a silencer method designed to scare people into speaking about this situation. But the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, the situation doesn't end there. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Well, there's now three icebergs given that there is three parts to this entire series. It's gone on for way too long, but ladies and gentlemen, things only get worse because with these sorts of situations, people start to do digging. The internet detectives love to come out and do the work and discover far worse things than we could have possibly imagined. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, in this part of the video, I want to explore the downfall of Miranda Sings. And yes, that may actually sound a little bit confusing, mainly because of these, well, uh, free, three hour long videos. I don't actually know how long this video is, but I'm just gonna guess it's three hours long. And yes, throughout these videos, we have been exploring the downfall of Colleen Ballinger. But technically, technically, Colleen Ballinger and Miranda Sings are two different individuals, technically. Colleen obviously is supposedly a real human being, and Miranda is a satire character that Colleen Ballinger created in the name of uh, comedy. And yes, if you believe that this is... You guys, I have just discovered the legend, the icon, the most... You believe this is... ...most popular person in the entire world other than... A comedic me. character. And congratulations, my friends, you are 14 years old, and I say you should just get off the channel right now. See you later, sunshine. 
Go enjoy, I don't know, a Minecraft YouTuber. Somebody where you actually belong, you know? So, not not here. And s especially not, I'm not just going here. On tour but ladies and gentlemen, my friends and family, if family are watching this, please leave the channel as well. But basically, as I said, a lot of people, a lot of internet detectives, with the downfall of Colleen Ballinger, have been digging into the Jedi archives of Miranda Sings. They have been going through the content uploaded on that channel, uploaded on the Twitter account of Miranda Sings, and all the other social media platforms that this character sadly exists on, and they have been just basically pulling out the absolute worst parts of all of this that has come from Miranda Sings. And whilst it would be very easy for me to go through a, a big list of all of these bad things that have been dug up and exposed with Colleen Ballinger's character Miranda Sings and people basically saying this is absolutely horrific, I really want to focus mainly on the fact that Colleen Ballinger and Miranda Sings aren't really that different. In fact, I would go as far to say that the whole argument of Miranda Sings being a character is starting to come into question with a lot of the clips being dug up. Because yes, some of the clips are just outright outrageous, but some clips being dug up are actually Colleen herself speaking about the character of Miranda and speaking about how pretty much Miranda Sings is rather than just a character, but actually a extension of Colleen Ballinger herself. And the main reason that I want to focus on that is given everything that has been exposed with Colleen Ballinger, in particular, some of the things that has gone on at her live shows with Miranda Sings Live, where she interacts very inappropriately with children, like we went through in my part two, it makes it a little bit worse when you start to consider that this character isn't as much as a character as we originally believed. Now, of course, in 2023, most people now do just see Miranda Sings as Colleen Ballinger, but ultimately, for the last 10 plus 12 years, people have just believed this to be a character. And ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to stand-up comedians and just people doing comedy in general, people like to use characters. They like to create something which is not actually them and something completely outrageous and different to who they are as a human being. It's one of the more traditional roots of comedy that a lot of people have done over the years, but the fact of the matter is, is I'm starting to think that this definitely isn't that, and it also leads into this ethical conversation of, are people using the argument of characters as an excuse to do absolutely outrageous and outright wrong things? Especially when you look at most of the things that Colleen was exposed for in the last two months. For example, her situation with Adam McIntyre. Colleen was so clearly acting inappropriately with a minor for a very long time, and she has been facing a lot of repercussions for this. Also, the stuff to do with Trisha Paytas, it involves very inappropriate interactions with minors, and all of the other stuff on the list with pretty much all of the other fan interactions with Colleen Ballinger. For example, some of the things in group chats where she would say horrible stuff like this and this. But then you start to look into the content of Miranda Sings, and the things being put out there in the world using this character, and, and, and you start to realize it's really no different to Colleen, but in this situation, it's just being put out there on a public front in the name of comedy, and when somebody calls out that supposed comedy, the defense will be, oh, it's a character, it's meant to be satire, it's not real. And yes, what I am trying to say is I, I I don't believe that this entire thing was a character. And in fact, I think we need to replace Miranda Sings was a character with Miranda Sings was an excuse. And my best example of that is in an interview that Colleen Ballinger did on a late night television show where she discussed the character of Miranda Sings and everything to do with it and how she implements Miranda Sings onto social media. And basically, this clip has been resurfacing a lot recently because of everything we're now discussing. Basically, in this clip, Stephen Colbert, I, I think that's how you pronounce his name, starts to speak about how for years he also himself had a character which was being used in the name of comedy, but with that character, he... <coughs> <laughs> I don't know what's happening right now. Maybe I'm being taken out by Colleen. Um, but I, I repeat, uh, <coughs> I repeat Fraser in the, in, in the chat, please. 
Basically, Stephen Colbert said that when he would perform as this character, he would demonstrate real parts of his personality, very negative parts, but he would basically use the defense of, oh, it's a character. He would get away with saying things that he genuinely believes by using the excuse of, it's just a character. And in this interview, pretty much, Colleen Ballinger herself confirms that, well, she did the exact same thing. Okay, look, we've got some technical issues. Basically, the clip that I was about to play you, it is copyright claimed. So if I put that video in this video, I'm going to get copyright claimed by Stephen Colbert, and he will take every bit of monetization that this video makes. So instead, I'm going to give a wonderful demonstration of what was being said between these people, and I'm going to have to do that every single time I refer to this clip. And that's great, because this clip is incredibly vital to this video. But basically, it starts off with Stephen saying, I played a character for many years and I get to piggyback on his ego and pretend that it isn't mine. The camera pans to Colleen and she says yes and laughs. Steven says, do you ever mean what she says, she being Miranda Sings, and Colleen in complete agreement gives a solid yes and laughs and then says all the time. There's a lot of time in character I'll say something so cruel or so um something I'm thinking about but won't actually say myself and it's very liberating to just say the things that I'm thinking. And Stephen says, can I give you some advice? Colleen says, yes. Stephen says, never tell people when those moments are. Colleen says, I won't. I promise. Stephen says, because I would sometimes agree with my character, but I would never want you to know when that exactly was, because I'd like you to like me. And Colleen, in agreement, says, right, exactly, yeah. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I I, I would like to know what are the horrible things that uh, that Colleen was saying through Miranda Sings that she genuinely believed herself as Colleen, but was clearly too afraid to say it as herself? What were the things that she actually believed? Was she being genuine in the tweet where she said last night a boy pulled a Cheeto out of Miranda Sings' pants, ate it, said it was moist, and that he wanted to pick my... My genital... <sighs> hey, yo, what the f***? Were you being genuine in that tweet? Or were you being genuine in the video of where you said to a girl... I I'm not even gonna repeat what you said, but were you being genuine in this clip? <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to give you guys some introspective deep commentary where I analyze this and say why this is wrong for the multitude of reasons. But the reality is, is all I can really say about this is, this is really weird. Like, what, like, why is this a thing? What, what, why are these kids being brought up onto stage? The kids not even actors, just random fans. And 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 what? Why? <laughs> why? And I understand that it's absolutely very easy to pull up a list of old things that Colleen Banjo has done and go through all of it and say why this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. But I don't really want to do that. I, as I said, have a list of bad things that Miranda Sings has said and done in the involvement of children. But I, I, I don't want to necessarily just go through the entire list. The fact of what I want to speak about here is, of course, as I said, the downfall of Miranda Sings. And that downfall comes from the fact that when you look at not just Colleen Ballinger's history of what she's been recently exposed for, but Miranda Sings' history, the two are absolutely intertwined. Miranda Sings' whole shtick from the list of things that I've been looking at is very, very clear to me. It is all just based on being incredibly inappropriate and uncomfortable around her child audience. That sounds like a massive claim to make, but when you look at everything that Miranda Sings was doing, Doing between the years of 2012 and like 2019, it just seems to be weird, weird things. These books right here, which were obviously being sold to children, showing things like this, bringing kids onto the stage where she pulls, uh, where, where, where she gets people to pull Cheetos out of her pants, uh, and stuff like that. It seems to me that this entire character was just based on being inappropriate. And then when you factor in all of the 
things that Colleen, as just Colleen was exposed for, it all is very, very similar. And then when you go back to that interview and the fact that she said that she does use this character to say things that she herself would not regularly say but clearly believes, it becomes very suspicious and very weird. And that has caused a lot of people over the last few months to go back and look at everything with no rose tinted glasses on anymore, no nostalgia goggles to their favorite YouTuber, but in fact, people that have now grown up and matured out of this content to realize that there was so much inappropriate stuff going on here. It's not like Colleen was putting out a bad YouTube video three years ago. In fact, there have been things like this that people have complained about. I, I, I don't care about this. Every YouTuber has done a bad video, said something that people don't agree with, something out of pocket, times change, you know, but... But this is not that. This is just absolutely obscene. And honestly, fellas, I think that Colleen Ballinger herself has always known that what she does with the Miranda Sings character is inappropriate. In fact, I'm just going to play something from the very first minute of that late night television intro, and it says quite a lot in my opinion. And yeah, because of the technical issues, I'm here to read it once again in the post edit. Basically, Stephen asks Colleen, what do you do for a living? And Colleen says, um, well, it's a little bit difficult, but I would say is imagine every single obnoxious person you've met in your life, put all of those qualities into one person, and I pretend to be that person for millions of people on the internet and get paid. Now, of course, here she says that she pretends to be this thing. Of course, uh, Stephen Colbert hasn't actually said anything about his character here. Then two minutes later, as I showed you previously, she then does expose herself and say, oh, well, yeah, uh, sometimes well, I, I, I do say, you know, things that I actually do think, but I can get away with it because it's a character. And I think that's very clear that, yes, she knows what she is doing with Miranda Sings in is inappropriate, and it is wrong, and that's why she is doing it with the character, because the character is simply an excuse. And obviously I'm not saying that every single satirical character out there is absolutely terrible. In fact, I, I love satire comedy. I love people that create characters to make people laugh and do outrageous things, but I, I don't love it when people are just using those characters as an excuse. And as I have said, it's very obvious to me that this Miranda Sings character has a pattern of behavior that is very similar with Colleen. We've seen this interview, and I think we can kind of get it out of there now that yes, this character is simply just an excuse. It's not some amazing comedian's brand new character that revolutionizes comedy. It's just somebody whose entire shtick is being very inappropriate with a young audience. And ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned previously the books that Colleen had wrote as the Miranda Sings character. This book, My Diary, which a lot of parents out there were absolutely outraged about because they thought that they were buying a child-friendly book, but then they discovered a bunch of terrible things in the book. Well, these books obviously have been sold as satire pieces, just like the Miranda Sings character, despite the books have photos of Colleen herself, like baby photos of her. And in the actual interview of Stephen Colbert, she speaks about this book and she speaks about how she got the ideas to write the things that she wrote in this book. You know, the jokes about her uncle, the incredibly inappropriate jokes, which, well, I, again, if these were just jokes to adults, you know, may, I, I can understand it, but like, these are jokes that sh she knows kids are going to write. She has seen her audience. She has done live shows. She has done meet and greets. You can still find them on YouTube and in every single one they are kids and she knows that these kids are the only actual people that are going to read these books because anybody above the age of 18 that reads this book that isn't a YouTuber severely needs to get help. But what I'm trying to get at here is yes they speak about this book and what I find fascinating is in this interview she pretty much admits that the book is inspired by well shock horror herself. So Stephen pulls out Miranda's book, which we went through in the previous video, and he says, now you're sharing Miranda's life in a different way. You have a new book called My Diary. And then they briefly speak about a few things to do with the book. And then Stephen says, well, what is the book about? And Colleen says, well, it's Miranda's diaries from a whole life duct taped together. And someone has stole those diaries and is selling it to the world. And Miranda is mortified, but it's based on the diaries I grew up writing 
thing because I was very dramatic and ridiculous as a child and so I took inspiration from it. And then they go on to have a conversation speaking about one of the stories in the book to do with when Colleen was doing miming when she was younger and this is actually a real story and they discuss this because the book contains multiple photos of when Colleen was actually a child and basically they just go on to discuss how this book was inspired by her childhood. Now ladies and gentlemen, I feel quite uncomfortable knowing that this book was inspired by her childhood, knowing some of the things that have been written in these books. It very much reminds me of Shane Dawson's books or Onision's books because they did the exact same thing and in these books they wrote some incredibly creepy things and I guess got away with it out of uh, it was a childhood thing or it, it, it was like um, some form of comedic act but the reality is is let's go through a list of some of the things in this book reminder this childhood book was uh, making jokes about 69ing and inappropriate relations with uncles torturing animals physically and emotionally abusing people and plenty of other other of other things. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not saying that Colleen Ballinger can't speak about her childhood, but it's very clear to me that this book wasn't designed to speak about her trauma. It wasn't like her uh, venting in a very specific way. It was obviously a book designed to clearly be inappropriate. The title very much says that. And then, you, uh, yeah, you look at the things in here and you start to think, now you know that this is actually just based on Colleen and not the Miranda thing. It's starting to get even more weird. Like, why would you write this in a book that you knew that kids would be reading? That is so, so weird. And why would you also admit that this book was inspired by childhood stuff, considering things like this are in the book? It makes it so much more insane to me. But it also brings up the whole thing of Miranda Sings simply being an excuse. Yes, I'm sure that Miranda Sings is an exaggerated version of Colleen, but it's still a version of Colleen, and I feel quite insane for even saying these things because Miranda Sings is obviously an absolutely outrageous character, but the fact of the matter is, is Colleen Ballinger is outrageous. She has done some outrageous things. When she was accused of a horrible crime, she went onto her main YouTube channel, got out a ukulele and played it. And I know you've heard that a million times at this point, but that is an absolutely outrageous thing. And it almost seems like it's something that Miranda Sings would do. And that's because they are so obviously just the same thing. And I just don't get, why would Colleen just not make a complete fictional story? It's not like YouTubers couldn't sell books back in 2015. I mean, Alfie Days literally released a book, which literally had nothing in it. And people bought it. You know, like, it, 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 it's a thing that happens. You could have sold the book, just did what Alfie Days did, and it would be happy days. But no, she went down this avenue of of everything that we've gone through in this book. And I don't think we need to go through even more of it, because personally, I don't want to have to gouge my eyes out after recording this video. But, but you get my point. Character is just excuse. And I know I keep saying that, but this is about the downfall of Miranda Sings, not Colleen Ballinger. And ultimately, that will just lead us to the fact that this isn't the downfall of Miranda Sings, it is the downfall of Colleen Ballinger. It's kind of like Inception. You're, you're in a character within a character within a book. That doesn't make any sense. But with us breaking down the character of Miranda Sings into just being Colleen, it then leads us back to the list that I mentioned earlier. The threads out there about the old Miranda Sings Colleen Ballinger content. Content like this just makes everything so much worse when you consider that the whole thing wasn't actually <laughs> satire. Like, obviously, I understand that in those titles, they were just outrageously clickbait, but it just seems that there is so much content based on being inappropriate with her audience. Ch -ch 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 you know what I'm saying? Like, it it it's just, why was this the shtick that she went with? It wasn't like she was really being edgy about literally anything else. It was just, I'm going to be on this one lane and I'm going to stick to it for years at the age of like 27 to 32. What? what why was this the pathway, especially given the young audience? And now a defense of Colleen will be, oh, well, the era of YouTube back in 2015 was very different. You had 
to be outrageous. You had to put crazy clickbait out there like Tana Mojo was putting out there in the world. Some ridiculous titles which were just obviously outrageous stretched out versions of the truth like titles like this. And that is a very generous defense in my opinion and I, I, I am willing to go for it. Don't get me wrong. Like here is a clip of Colleen speaking in that same interview about clickbait and how you would put outrageous things out there on the internet. Steven says, so what is it that first sells people in the video? Because we don't know what it's going to be, so is it the title? It then pans to Colleen and she says, but it's changed a lot over the years. I grew because people originally loved to hate somebody and they all chose me. That's how I grew 10 years ago. But now it's all about the title and the thumbnail and being shocking and dramatic and absurd, which is something that drives me nuts. But, and then Steven interjects saying, oh, so do you engage in that? And Colleen Larson says, oh, definitely. Steven then says, so if we were going to use this, this interview, if I wanted to make this a viral video, what might you name what we've just done? And Colleen goes on to say, well, we've got to put something in the title that's like shocking or emotional or dramatic or epic, you know, some catchy words like that. But on top of that, you have to think of every word that we've talked about. Like we talked about childbirth and having a baby. So maybe Miranda Sings gives birth on the Stephen Colbert show and Stephen interjects saying to a hairy squash and they all laugh and agree and the crowd goes wild for some reason. Now, whether you ethically agree with that reasoning to the clickbait, that's completely up to you for deciding. And I I'm really putting it out there for a, a little bit of like a nuance some understanding because maybe Colleen would say well look, there, there is context here you know there is reasons that I have those uh, crazy titles cr absolutely insane titles and in fact in some cases with the titles on her channels it wasn't just the Miranda Sings channel it was also the Colleen Ballinger channel and it comes back to that whole thing of the blurred lines between is this the character is this not the character is this all the same thing and we will get into why I think this is happening and and why again on both channels these same style jokes are happening but yes these titles are obviously wild but my question is is like oh Okay, but you can make the crazy clickbait titles, but why would you say this in the video? If you were Santa, name three people you would want to sit on your lap. <laughs> this is gonna sound so creepy. My answer is so creepy, but I don't mean it to be creepy. I were Santa, I would. <laughs> this is gonna sound so bad. I can't admit this. This sounds so pedophilish. I would want the girls from Dance Moms. It sounds super creepy, but it's totally innocent. I just think they're adorable and super talented, and I'm in love with them in a very sweet babysitter child sort of way. That still sounds creepy. Please, Colleen, don't put this online. Now you can say to me all you like, oh, well, well, she said that she had innocent intentions. Ladies and gentlemen, when you think about somebody below the age of 18 and your immediate interaction goes to what she said there, there's a problem. Why would you immediately even go and say that? That is just... Why? What? What? Like, seriously? Or I, again, I said earlier, like, I can't give any introspective deep commentary. But again, the question is just why would you do that? And it very much is building this again foundation that all of the content that Miranda was putting out there, or Colleen was putting out there, was just this weird jokes and and, and content about children and, and and just being very weird and inappropriate why and i understand that old content can age bad and people can grow and change it's something that everybody does and i am willing to be generous for pretty much anybody but the problem is is I can't be generous over something like that. I can't be generous over somebody that has built their empire on this style of content whilst at the age of 27. She wasn't like a, a teenager or something being edgy. It was, it was, no, 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 this is... Is really, really weird. From the book to the tweet to the actual statement itself, why? But the worst part is, is this isn't even the worst example. This is actually one of the more tame examples, which probably makes you think, Jesus, like what, what else is there? But with that previous clip, you can't even now make the argument of, oh, Colleen didn't choose to have a child audience because even if she had an adult audience and was saying what she said in that clip, it would still be absolutely wild. But obviously she did have a child audience back in the day. She did have a bunch of teenagers or children watching her and they didn't understand that what she was saying in that clip was obviously extremely weird. I don't understand why 
why she did this and also you have to take into the context of this wasn't the Miranda Sings channel this was Colleen in 2013 and I understand that was a very very long time ago but the problem is is these weird comments these weird jokes gradually stemmed into the character of Miranda Sings up until 2019 but the problem was was that the audience was so obviously accustomed to this humor from when she was just Colleen Ballinger back in 2013 or 2008 to when she was fully doing the Miranda Stick thing on Netflix with live shows in books. The audience were accustomed to this. They were used to this. They thought that what Colleen was saying, whether she was Miranda Sings or Colleen Ballinger, they thought it was completely normal. I've asked the question multiple times throughout these videos of how did nobody point out the behavior in, in, in everything that Colleen was doing in the Miranda Singh stuff, but also just the Colleen Ballinger live show, which was on Netflix? How did she get away with that for so long? Well, it's because it was normalized. She, oh, by making these jokes for so long to the young audience who are impressionable, they, they don't understand things quite like adults do. They thought it was normal. And then because she on purpose built these relations with her fans, she would get away with the things that she was saying behind the scenes because it was normalized and that makes the whole thing so much more sinister and i think the best example of colleen's young audience at the time not understanding why the things that she was doing on our live shows were wrong is when you actually go back to the book reviews that we looked at in the previous video when these adults bought their children colleen ballinger's books they sensibly proofread the books beforehand and they immediately realized what was going on in these books was inappropriate, should not be viewed by children, and they left angry reviews. They said that kids shouldn't read this stuff and parents should be wary. So it's not really a case of times have changed, you know, people have changed their morals and people are different in 2023 to 2017. It's no, that was weird back then for adults. It was just she clearly had a very young audience and they clearly thought what was going on was normal until they actually got a little bit older. But even then, it was so ingrained in the community via the videos and via the things going on behind the scenes that when Adam McIntyre bravely came out and spoke about these things in 2020, he was immediately dismissed and rejected as a liar. And that is because of how ingrained this style of behavior, the attitudes that Colleen was giving via her character, but also via her herself was into her audience. There was something known as a parasocial relationship because of everything that she was doing on the channel, because of how personal it was, how funny it was, how relatable it was in some ways for people and how inappropriate it was, how different it was for these young audiences. They thought that this person was clearly incredible, but the reality was is that's absolutely not the truth, but parasocial bonds were built via the channel and then gradually behind the scenes scenes and that led to some sinister things happening and people being discarded and called liars. Everything in this story is a massive puzzle and we have to add it all up to work out how everything was allowed to happen in this situation because yes obviously in 2023 now everybody believes Adam and believes all the other people in the situation but obviously for years that was not the case and that was because of how everything was handled in the Khalid Ballinger Empire. There are so many things out there, but when I look at them now, I think to myself, how was this overlooked? How was this thing that was said? How was this clip that was said on either of her channels overlooked? And of course, it all comes down to the parasocial connections that she built with her young audience that has been massively exposed over the last few months. And I'm going to play you the worst example, I think, that I personally, well, I personally, I personally believe this is one of the worst examples that I saw on a Twitter thread of where Kalina's at a beach with her friend and she's vlogging herself and she thought it was appropriate to... <sighs> I don't even want to describe what she does, so I'm just going to play the video, and there, there are going to be some cuts, because whilst nothing actually, I believe, was illegally recorded, there was seemingly a very weird attempt at something here, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to play the clip and allow you to make an opinion for yourself. 
see a little naked child just ran up to me, a little boy with a little pee pee. Um, he's laying on the sand right now. <laughs> I'm gonna try to get him. Um, I don't know if that's him, if you can see that. He wanted me to blow his bubbles. That sounds really dirty. Don't no worry, they were right. actual bubbles. Yes. That's and cheap blue. <laughs> Now, that is, in my opinion, one of the weirdest things that I've seen a multi-million subscriber YouTuber do. For one, it's just weird for anybody to do that. The thing said, why? But secondly, it shows the ingrained nature of what she was doing, the content that was going on to the channel. It shows how normalized it was she thought it was fine to do and record and then publish that video the things that she was saying and doing in that video she thought it was appropriate to try and record what she described in that video and to me that is just so insane but it it does kind of explain how she got away with it her young audience probably would have thought oh that's so wacky that's so funny but then you get a little bit older and then you realize that's so wrong. And there are subreddits that have been dedicated over the last few years actually analyzing these clips. It's not like people have only been going through Colleen and the things that she has done in her community in the last few months. It has actually been going on for years when adults or ex-fans have realized some of the incredibly weird things that Colleen has done on her YouTube channels, but it wasn't exactly a massive scandal until what happened in 2023 with Cody Tyler and Adam's story becoming massive and viral again. Parents and adults and people that have just gotten a bit older over the years have been speaking in private or smaller circles on the corners of the internet about these things and realizing that it was wrong. But now it is becoming a wider conversation because it is now a snowball effect. The snowball is getting bigger and bigger and bigger every single day. And that is now leading to the hyperanalyzation of not just Colleen, but her character and leading us to this now conversation that we're having about the two just being pretty much the exact same thing. But obviously, the video that I showed you previously on the beach, that was Colleen Ballinger being Colleen. She wasn't playing the supposed character of Miranda Sings. It was her being her in an old video. Now, old is the key word here because it very much seems to me that she pretty much abandoned this type of humor that she was displaying in this video on her main channel, on her Colleen channels. As you can see, it says Colleen's Corner. And I think she abandoned that style because she knew that playing the character of Miranda, she can, as I said earlier, use that as an excuse. And the reason that I'm now saying that is because I found a clip of where she's being Colleen and speaking about the Miranda Sings character and the cheese ball skit that we spoke about in the previous video. And in this video, she acknowledges that the skit obviously sounds creepy but it's not creepy because it's the character and I'm just gonna play you that clip right now tonight at the show something really funny happened there um, is a part in the show where I bring up different boys that like Miranda flirts with basically on stage and there's this part where like I try to get a guy to put like his hand down my pants I know it sounds really bad but it's totally harmless and Want a cheese ball? Come on, Brainy. Today I chose a boy who was pretty young and um, he <laughs> did something I've never experienced before on stage and it made me laugh so hard on stage. It was probably the biggest break I've had on stage like ever because I like it just caught me so off guard because it's never happened before. But usually the people I pull on stage are really enthusiastic and excited to be a part of the show and he just was like not having it. I tried to get him to get like a cheese ball like from my pants and he was like, no, not gonna happen. And he was really serious and I was like, okay, whatever. Like that's not a big deal. So then I tried to get him to kiss me on my cheek and he was like, no. And he was like really serious and like would not do it. So then I said, well, this has never happened to me before. And he goes, well, now it has. So then I just like was like, Oh my god, like he just shocked me and the audience is dying of laughter. I'm dying of laughter and he is just serious. Like here's a picture of me laughing and he is totally serious, like not having it. And so then he goes, 
I came here to be your friend, not your bae. <laughs> Now she realizes that yes, what is being described there sounds weird, but it is okay because it's the character of Miranda Sings. It's meant to be funny. But then you go back to that clip before of Colleen, the older clip. And to me personally, that is really not much different from what Miranda Sings does. And then you go back to the interview of where she is saying that, oh, she does things that she believes as Miranda sings, and it's like a, a, a stretched out version of herself. And you start to put the pieces together, and, and yes, you come to this conclusion, which I've said like seven times now, of it's just an excuse. And those excuses have, you know, <laughs> allowed really, really weird behavior to be pushed aside and be like, oh, it was in the name of comedy, but... I, I personally don't remember Bill Burr or any other stand-up comedian doing things like this. This! His This! Is This! Is This! Is <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, if you thought that was weird, it only gets weirder. Ho, 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 I'm the nurse. I've come to get this baby out from you. Just push from your tukey really hard. <laughs> and breathe lacrosse breathing like this. Hee <laughs> hee <laughs> <laughs> this is so genuinely bizarre to me, but again, I will say, I don't think I remember a comedian putting a child out of an audience and, and saying the things that she said there, and that's mainly because when a comedian is saying the level of inappropriate sexual jokes that Colleen says at her live shows, there is a thing called 18 plus adult only. When these comedians do their live shows, a lot of them, if they do speak about outrageous and provocative things in a satire manner, they will make sure that only adults are coming to their shows because it is only appropriate for adults. But Colleen very obviously does not do that. It is parents taking their children to these live shows. Children should not be at these shows, but I'm not even blaming the parents here, because for a lot of parents out there, they probably think that Miranda sings something like this, somebody who clearly makes books designed for kids. You can't tell me that this isn't a book designed for at least a teenage audience. They probably think that this is a curator that makes videos for younger people, especially considering the fact that I went onto Reddit and I found somebody uploaded a screenshot of Miranda sings his content on YouTube Kids. Now, I believe that that is an automated system, but I think that says it all, and Colleen definitely knows that this is her audience, yet she says things like this to their face when she can even see how young they are. So I'm hitting the snack in the perfect place, literally. <laughs> And so now, watch this, we're on the date, James. It's really romantic. Oh, we're getting close and personal. Oh, but I'm so hungry, James. Hold on, I got a snack. <laughs> Was this in your self-health book? Was this in my self-health book? Was it? Because I brought self-health with me and I was just wondering. Well, shouldn't you know if you've read it? <laughs> I'm just kidding, James. I'm just kidding. I love you. I'm just kidding. Do you want a cheese ball? Um, I'd love them. I can't believe I'm reaching in there right now. And how old are you? Nine. Okay. <laughs> so oh. I feel like I'm sorry, James. You're going to have to wait till you're a little bit older. But I can't lie to you, fellas. I've never seen a comedian that has uh, pulled out a child from the stage and uh, said that to them. That... I've never witnessed that personally. I've never seen them do it as an ongoing joke. It's just not something that I've seen a, a comedian publish in their book that children so obviously read. But with these very weird experiences on the live shows of Miranda Sings and with this behavior just simply being normalized because of this character, I now want to refer back to the clip that I played you earlier where Colleen is speaking about the cheese ball skit of where it went wrong with another child that she brought on the stage. And I want you to listen to what she says very closely and he was like no 
And he was like really serious and like would not do it. So then I said, well, this has never happened to me before. And he goes, well, now it has. So then I just like was like, oh my God. Like he just shocked me and the audience is dying of laughter. I'm dying of laughter and he is just serious. Like here's a picture of me laughing and he is totally serious, like not having it. And so then he goes, I came here to be your friend, not your bae. Now, personally, I think this clip is quite fascinating because Colleen is obviously laughing. It's like, oh, it's so funny, you know, but... I, I think the point that the kid was making is, is is actually quite insane to me. The kid realized that I'm not here for that. You know, that that I, I don't want that. That is not why I am here. But, you know, people just clap and laugh because it's the character of Miranda Sings and it's just ingrained into the audience, normalized there, as we said. And people clap and laugh, but even some kids were like, no. <laughs> That's weird. The kids weren't there for that. They were there for a funny time, you know? Funny times with jokes like this. Oh, it <laughs> Look, we can speak about how weird this comment is and how all of the comments being made towards these children are weird and how the fact that Col Colleen is based his entire character on this very weird genre of comedy. We can speak about that, but we can also speak about the fact that this just, it's not, it's not funny. Like the fact of the matter is, is this character is only funny for kids. I don't think I've ever heard an adult say, oh yeah, my favorite comedian, I keep saying Bill Burr, Bill Burr and um, I don't know, Ma Michael McIntyre. And then you, you turn to your friend and they go, oh, my favorite comedian is Miranda Sings. At that point of time, I would say, why are there three children wearing a suit of my friend's skin? And that that's not even meant to be a joke. I would be genuinely concerned that there is a child at the table with me. You can go into any comment section nowadays and it'll pretty much just be people saying they don't understand how people ever found this funny and how, um, why people were laughing at this. But the fact of the matter is, is, is yes, only kids would find this stuff funny because kids find outrageous things funny. You can say a swear word and a kid will laugh because they have, they're in a stage of their life where they've been told to not say those words because those are bad words. So when somebody says the bad words a lot, it's pretty funny to a kid and that pretty much is just the style of comedy at these live shows in an incredibly inappropriate format. And that format stretches to pretty much every part of Colleen's empire, from videos to podcasts to books to live shows to even collaborations with Jojo Siwa. Because yes, in this deep dive of the downfall of Miranda Sings and the content surrounding the YouTube channel there, people have also started to bring up the old collaborations between Jojo when she was 13 years old and Colleen when she was in her late 20s. And people have been saying that these interactions and collaborations were just very weird. And obviously it is very easy, as I said, to pick out old content and to be like, oh, this hasn't aged well in the regards of the social norms of 2000. 2023. But even back then, I think if I saw the sort of things that were being said in those videos as an adult, I would have said, that's, that's really, really weird. And the reason that I didn't say it then was, well, I wasn't watching Jojo Siwa content because the content was for kids. And that makes this even weirder. Anyway, so I'm going to teach you how to twerk. And I got my haters back off pants. Yes. So there's many, many different ways. But here's how we're going to rehearse today. We're going to go okay. five, six, seven, and eight. Go one, two, Whoa. three, four. Go five, six. Stop! Jojo, stop! Don't look at her! Do not look at her that way! Fetus! She fetus. doesn't know what she's fetus. doing! She's a child! Fetus. Don't fetus. do that, Jojo! Fetus, 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 fetus. Jojo, okay. You cannot do that! Why not? That will entice all the people! Look, I just don't really get any point of this. I, 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 what's being said here is just absolutely insane. But at the same time, I also just don't get the need for the for the twenty-seven year old or, or thirty year old, yeah, actually thirty years old woman. I don't get why she needs to say these things in her collaboration with the thirteen year old internet star. Just don't say that, and just I don't know. Play a video game or something, you know, play Truthful Dare, I don't know, something that isn't that, you know, you didn't even need to say that. And that's the thing with all of this, Colleen didn't need to do any of this, but she did. And obviously, that leads us into the conversations we've had in the previous videos about the very disturbing interactions that she had with her fans outside of the character. The normalization of this behavior was very, very rife in her community, and it even stretches to extremely popular and famous internet stars like Jojo Siwa. But if you thought that clip was just the end of it, no, there are 
far more. Next thing is you are not supposed to dress porn when you are dancing, and I can see your entire legs. Stop it! I'm not realizing your shirt says milk all over it. Do you know? Like you drink that? milk? Yes. You know that comes from a private part? Did you hurt your tinky? What's a tinky? <laughs> now, yes, this is incredibly weird, but it. <laughs> It doesn't even end there. That there's just so much, and you can say, "Are you nitpicking?" And you no, know, I don't think a thirty-year-old should be speaking to a a thirteen-year-old like this. And I think the only reason that it was passed off is because, oh, they're famous internet stars. That to me is still weird. There is definitely a streak in my panties right now. Is there? Oh, wait. Should we get that looked at? No, you want to look at my no, streak in my panties? Not me. Jojo not me. is disgusting. Not me. She lies to her mother. Honey. She lies to her fans, and she wants to look at the poop in your panties. I said not me. If you go every day in your panties, that's something you should have looked at. You could have something wrong with you. Nothing is wrong with me. I, I don't want to look at it. A doctor. A doctor. I just have active panties, Jojo. Sue me. I don't want to sue you. Well, you want to look at my panties? No. I seriously am just so confused about why her entire. Miranda Singh's character was just built upon the joke of inappropriate interactions with children. Why? Like, why? That's that's the main question we can take from this section of the video. Obviously, with the lawyer section, there's some understanding to hiring one of the best lawyers in the world. Obviously, it makes it look extremely terrible that you are being hired by this person who is representing terrible people. But obviously, there's some sense we can put into that. But this is just absolutely wild and you can ask the question of why has she not put a second response out yet but it's probably because the snowball every single day gets bigger and bigger and her lawyers are looking at this thinking how much is there <laughs> every day a new thing a new thing a new th it's wild and it just all makes me think back to the statement that i started off this section of the video with where she speaks with stephen colbert and with that statement now after everything that we've looked at it's just even more insane. Do you ever mean what she says? And Colleen, in complete agreement, gives a solid yes and laughs, and then says, all the time. There's a lot of time in character, I'll say something so cruel or so, um, something I'm thinking about but won't actually say myself, and it's very liberating to just say the things that I'm thinking. Again, I want to ask the question that I asked about 50 minutes ago. What are the things that you say as Miranda's things that you actually secretly believe? Because pretty much everything that we can look at on this channel is just the same jokes after the same jokes. Obviously, there are jokes that aren't just related to this thing, but at these live shows, in these books, it very much seems to be on the same trajectory. You can speak about how there's these videos and stuff, but in the books, in the things that she's selling, the main part of this character does just seem to be saying inappropriate things to the child audience and i mean what, what what was genuine colleen can you answer that was it this so i just got back from the doctor i have good news and bad news the good news is i'm not having an alien that's literally the only good news so she's doing an ultrasound and she goes oh you want to know the gender of the baby and i go yes please tell me it's american please and then she said it's a boy what? Babies aren't boys or girls until they come out. They're just like little blobs in there. But she showed me and she goes, look at that. And I go, what's that? And she goes, <gasps> and I go, what is that? And she goes, <coughs> she said, it's a penis. <laughs> All this time I thought I was a virgin. <laughs> now I'm not a virgin anymore. There's a penis in me at all times. A tiny penis. <sighs> 32 years old. That's how old she was. In that clip. I really don't even know what to even say after hearing something like this. It, it, it's just absolutely so, so strange. And I understand people will say, it's a joke, it's a joke. It's, I mean, yeah, it, it is. But what even drives a human being to say something about that? About, they're not even born child. And, and when you look at everything else, why... Why is it, again, that the genre of jokes is just this? It's the edgy, the other forms of edgy humor is, is never used. It's just 
this. Now, obviously, I don't believe that Colleen Ballinger had this grand master manipulative plan to control her audience and take over and make sure that she gets away with absolutely everything, but I definitely do believe that her style of humor was intentionally normalized. I think she regularly tested the barriers with the things that she said and with the whole excuse of her character. If she was ever called out because of the things that she said as Miranda Sings, she could simply say, oh, it's just me, you know, being either clickbaity, me being Miranda, and even when it was just her not in the Miranda, you know, character, she could say, oh, it's just outrageous clickbait and stuff like that, and it's so strange to me how this was so deeply ingrained into her audience that jokes about her unborn child were, were considered funny, like, jokes like that, and to me, it's just incredibly strange, creepy, and just out right outrageous. And when speaking about using the Miranda Sings character to say outrageous things, I, I want to actually bring up a clip from Shane Dawson, who did an interview ages ago, where he speaks about Miranda Sings and, and Colleen Ballinger and that character, and he speaks about his interactions with Colleen and how she actually is word on word described as hateful. Miranda or Colleen or Miranda. <laughs> right, um, depending on which, when, where she's at. Colleen is the best because she needs 10 of these fans. She is the most hateful, shadiest. I love her. Like whenever we hang out, uh, literally the first words out of her mouth are, okay, like, what do you got? Who do you hate? Who's next? Like just going in on everybody. I love it. Oh, you got to get her on here. <laughs> oh, I would love to. It's rough. She, Please throw in a good word for yeah. us. <laughs> That's the thing is a lot of, you, a lot of well, I guess, comedians in general, like a lot of the comedy comes from hate, self-hatred. Uh -huh. And when you hate yourself, you hate everybody around you. Right. So I've got a little better at it, but uh, no, hanging out with her, man. She loves to throw some zingers, huh? Loves it. <laughs> loves it. And she's so good at being nice to like, she'll do collabs with every YouTuber and they think like, I'm, oh, I'm like Colleen's best friend. And then we get together and I do the same thing, but then we'll get together and oh man, no, they the only shame. knew. Now Shane in that clip basically says that him and Colleen are incredibly fake people and bad people. And this is a point where Shane and Colleen were very popular. They were doing very well. They were getting on live shows. They were getting on interviews and stuff like that. And they were confident in saying stuff like that. And that makes me think, what were they saying behind the scenes? But also, it probably does then come into the Miranda Sings thing, because as he is saying there, they would say things that they wouldn't say publicly, and then, as Colleen said in her interview, that's basically what she does with Miranda Sings. She says the things that she would not say publicly, and the, the pieces of the puzzles just get added up and added up, and eventually you do, do just have... Colleen Ballinger, Miranda Sings, I, I, I don't believe that this is a satirical character, and to come to some form of conclusion to this segment, I think for years upon years, it has just been used as an excuse to get away with this incredibly weird stuff at these live shows. Maybe it's because that she couldn't actually think of any funny jokes because she wasn't funny, and it comes into that whole conversation of saying, you know, bad words to kids, and it will immediately make them laugh because it's cheap humor, kids laugh at that sort of thing, but ultimately it isn't an excuse. The normalization of this behavior in this community has come from that, and it has allowed her to get away with just so much, so much horrible stuff. It's not like people are just nitpicking a YouTuber, like a regular YouTuber, like, I don't know, they get in some drama and people start to be like, oh, what about this video from six years ago? No, it's far more sinister and far worse than that, and it is genuinely disturbing to me. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I just want you to think back to some of the original exposés that came out about Colleen two months ago, the group chats, the weenie chat, the things that were said in there, chats full of underage people. Back in 2016, back in 2017, around that time, this level of behavior was normalized because they saw what was Colleen was saying in her videos, they saw what she was saying at the live shows, in the books, they thought that was regular, normal normal interactions between an adult and a child. But obviously, as time has gone on, people have grown up, people have now exposed that as they realized that was obviously not the case. None of this is normal, and day by day, things continue to get even weirder. And I genuinely do not understand how Colleen thinks or how her lawyers think that they're somehow going to rectify this situation. And as we dig through these Jedi archives of the Miranda 
Just Sing's YouTube channel and everything that we've gone through, you really have to think about that ukulele video and how much more insane it seems that she even put that out, that she even tried to somewhat defend herself after everything. In this massive story which changes every single day, another person is exposed, new information comes out, information in the past turns out to be false, there are so many pieces to this puzzle and I think it is vital that we speak about Miranda Sings in general because I think it is such an essential piece to everything in this story and it's not just everything to do with Adam or anything to do with her ex-husband. Whilst they are obviously the most important parts of this story, I think it would be wild for us to turn a blind eye to this and just see it as nitpicking. I absolutely don't think it is that and that is why I think it is even more insane that people out there are still to this day defending Colleen Ballinger because as we have seen Colleen isn't just popular in the form of YouTube media, she has some friends in the mainstream media. She got on late night television and that is why it doesn't surprise me that there are reputable, I can't even speak English, reputable media outlets that are now defending Colleen despite everything we've gone through today and in the past two videos, in Adam's videos about this situation, in every documentary about this situation, despite all of that, the media still defend this person. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen, in this section of the video, I want to go over Colleen Ballinger's connection to the media. Now, we will be going through an old article, which I'm sure a lot of you have already heard about at this point, but I think it is vital to look at because it really exemplifies how a lot of influencers, especially nowadays, are attempting to get away with a lot of their horrible actions. Now, of course, there's going to be a lot of speculation here because this article that we're going to be going through is not an interview, but there are definitely some very strange and rather off-putting things going on here. And of course, I am talking about the Vanity Fair article. This is something that absolutely blew up on the internet around a month ago. A lot of people were discussing this, a lot of people saw this, and they were just deeply confused. They, they didn't know why this article was actually created, mainly because this article was just absolutely insane and especially knowing that it came from a company like Vanity Fair. Now obviously they're not like BBC News or some big actual newscasting company but they are somebody which is, is an established company you know a lot of people know about Vanity Fair so that makes us even more confused about this. How the Miranda Singh slash Colleen Ballinger scandal went off the rails. Now at first glance, if you don't know what this actual article is about and if you've only just read that headline, you'll probably be thinking to yourself, well, it's, it seems like a pretty impartial headline because yes, a lot of things in this situation have gone absolutely just crazy, just to a point of where you didn't even expect it to go to. And if you saw this headline, you probably wouldn't think that this was going to be an absolute hit hit piece, which this article very much is. A lot of people around the world, when they read this article, were genuinely shocked at what they were reading. They were shocked that somebody could go and write something which is just so unbelievably out of touch and clearly victim blaming the innocent people involved in this situation. So ladies and gentlemen, pretty much this article is a documentation, a heavy, you know, emphasis on documentation of what happened in the Colleen Ballinger scandal, in particular between Colleen and Adam McIntyre. Pretty much in this article, it briefly goes over some of the things that Colleen was accused of, and it presents these accusations as something which really doesn't have any substance. Despite everything that we've gone over in these long, long videos, it pretty much makes it out to sound like these are very substantiated claims, and it's just a lot of rumors and gossip, and a lot of people were uh, particularly confused at the fact that this article also was a complete attack on Adam McIntyre. Entire. But before we go into any of that, the main issue that this article immediately sparked up with a lot of people around the world didn't actually come from the headline or the contents of what was in this article, but it actually came from Twitter. Well, X. It still sounds really weird. X.com, because pretty much they obviously shared this article and a lot of people 
were upset with how they presented the tweets. One can see the de-evolution of the Miranda Sings empire and see that the longer it drags out, the harder it is to pin down the exact truth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, of course, the moment that this was tweeted, a lot of people immediately said, well, obviously, this is the most victim blamey thing that they've ever seen. But secondly, being difficult to pin down the truth in this situation, honestly, for me personally, is, is it, it's just not true. When you see things like this and this, it, it, these things are very obvious to what is actually going on here. And I really want to know what they exactly mean by it's difficult to pin down the truth. The screenshots are there. The DMs are there. The Trisha Paytas texts are there. Everything is publicly available. So the question is, what is going on? on. We have a major news outlet in Vanity Fair posting something like this, and it immediately sparked confusion. Why? Why would this media company take shots at the victims involved in the situation and take shots at the credibility of the accusations in this story? Why? would they do that? Now, of course, everybody can have their opinion, and of course, people can, you know, speculate and, and, and say certain things, but when the evidence is, it's not just screaming at you in the face, it is, it, I, 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 there's not even a description, it's just, just ev it's not even evidence, it's just almost admission, admissions of guilt, and then when the ukulele video came out, and the fact that Colleen's lawyers have never really put out a major statement about the major allegations, surely all of this is incredibly telling, so why did Vanity Fair do this? Well, ladies and gentlemen, just like everything in this story, it seems that there is possibly a sinister part to even this chapter in the story. Yes, just in the section of me reading you guys an article, it seems that there is still some rather peculiar things happening behind the scenes. Now, I should say, of course, this is just mere speculation, but a lot of people started to do digging and they found two particular videos from Vanity Fair. Miranda Sings hijacks a stranger's Tinder, Vanity Fair. Colleen Ballinger, in brackets Miranda Sings, explains her Instagram photos, Vanity Fair. Now, naturally, I think given a lot of things that we've gone over today and given a lot of the weird stuff that has happened in this situation in general, this is immediately going to make you, me, and pretty much everybody else incredibly suspicious because obviously there is a connection between Vanity Fair and Colleen Ballinger five years ago. And with a relationship like that, would I be surprised if somebody was going to do a little favor for their little friend who is in a lot of trouble? Personally, I don't really think that's much of a shock. I have seen this sort of thing happen in the media multiple times. Over the years, over the last decade, so many people, in particular in Hollywood, have gotten away with absolutely horrible actions because they have been protected by specific journalists. Now, of course, I'm not coming for the entire media here. I actually think it's a bit of a problem to outright attack all media and generalize the media based on one journalist. I think journalists are integral to society when it comes to exposing the truth about very serious things and there are some actual fantastic articles out there about this situation which makes this article even more confusing and my friends there are three genuine possibilities that i think could have occurred in this situation possibility number one the journalist of this article genuinely was unbiased and had no people chiming in they didn't feel like they needed to do a favor for anybody and this was just an article based on their actual opinion. Now, for me, I, given what we saw with those two videos, do not believe that. And also, given the fact that the journalist of this article blocked Adam McIntyre, I am also kind of enticed to say that I really don't believe it even more based on that information. Because why would a journalist block a victim? Why would a journalist block the victim that they are writing about, even if it was in a negative sense? So this moves us into the two other possibilities, which I think have a little bit more chance of happening. Possibility number two, Colleen Ballinger, behind the scenes, may have asked for help from journalists out there that she may or may not have acquaintance with, or may or may not have connections to certain media companies. Now, personally, 
I don't believe that this is actually what happened. I, I, I would be really shocked if it did, and there are more reasons to why I think that this could have possibly happened, which we will get into in a second, but I, I want to have some genuine faith here and say that Colleen hasn't gone speaking to journalists and begging them to make these articles about them, so I think it's possibly possibility number three, which is the more believable one, which is, I definitely believe that Colleen Ballinger has connections in the media, and I believe that those journalists out there wanted to protect their friend out of some form of weird loyalty. I don't think that Colleen asked for it, but I definitely think that a suspicious connection between her and Vanity Fair played a part in this obvious PR article being curated. But also something that does seem a little bit more suspicious to me as well, and I may be reaching here a little bit, is the fact that when you Google Vanity Fair and the name of Colleen Ballinger's lawyer, there are multiple articles which reference him and speak about him, and in fact, in some of those articles as well, it speaks about how Vanity Fair received information from close sources to some of the clients of Colleen's lawyer. Now, personally, I don't think this is actually proof of anything, but I think it definitely does show connection between Vanity Fair and some of the people in the circle of Colleen's lawyers. And of course, that is just speculation, but based on the fact that she has been into Vanity Fair studio, she has recorded content with Vanity Fair. To me personally, it really wouldn't shock me, but I should just say that this is of course my opinion. This part of the video is mere speculation, but that speculation was only intensified based on the thing that I mentioned earlier. Yes, I said that there is something which made me think that possibility number two and three were plausible, and that actually comes from Trisha Paytas. Now, I understand that Trisha is not exactly somebody who has been credible in the past, but based on what we have seen in this situation, Trisha is another victim of Colleen Ballinger. What was going on behind the scenes with Trisha's explicit online 18 plus content was absolutely horrific, and I think Trisha has probably been speaking mainly truth in this situation, because at this point, what does she have to gain from lying if Colleen could also then just come out and expose her? So what I want to now refer to is a clip that I found on a podcast from around four weeks ago at the time of recording this video of Trisha speaking about journalists being used in the media to, I guess, protect people and do a little favor for a friend out there. I was mostly interested in why, like how this article came to be and why it was so extreme in pointing all the blame on Adam, who was only like a fraction of everything that happened. A very you know? fraction, I feel. Yeah. Because yeah. there's so many people who have shared like their stories and experiences. And it was weird. The article kind of overlooked it. So I was like, think putting my experience out there, I was like, okay, obviously it was some kind of favor, like in journalism, especially entertainment, like you do favors for celebrity, like teams oh, and stuff. Oh, that does happen. Yeah, like there's If PR. you know them. Yeah, like, you can do stuff as, like, a favorite article, like, write up something small about a celebrity's, like, little event or something. Right. Or cover something good that they did um, as, like, a relationship kind of thing because it's all mm. about relationships. Right. But it's very interesting to me that they covered the Colleen drama. And not only did they cover it and, like, be very much, like, on her side and minimize everything else, but then they also – the article also, like, came after, like, Rolling Stone and Huffington Post, like, almost, like, making fun of – uh, their exposés that they did. Like I said, the article seems very, like, PR. It's it's uh... very odd. Now, ladies and gentlemen, of course, this isn't evidence of anything, and I have to, again, say that this is obviously just speculation, but... It is a little bit weird that those Vanity Fair videos exist. Trisha Paytas clearly acknowledges that journalists do do favors in the media for people that they have connections with. And I'm going to throw in another article from another influencer who has gone through fairly similar controversies in the last few years, and that is James Charles. Because recently, another media company did an interview with James where, to me personally, it seems like a complete PR move. That 
designed to completely exonerate James Charles of the things that he had done in the past. The article spoke about James no longer wanting to be cancelled. It spoke about false allegations about James, despite there being very real allegations about James. And to me personally, I saw this article as a complete PR piece, but also a favour to a friend who had connections in the media. And as we've seen, James Charles has a good PR team, Colleen Ballinger has connections to top class lawyers, and it's getting very, very weird. And going into this dark corner of the internet where I don't think we've actually ever been in, we are now seeing lawyers get involved, the media get involved, things are feeling very Hollywood, and I don't mean the good part of Hollywood, I mean the very dark and creepy aspect of Hollywood, which for years was covered up, shadowed away, put in the dark, but got exposed in the Me Too movement. A lot of bad people had their names exposed. And of course, I'm not going to say that Colleen is bad as this person or this person, but everything seems very similar to how things happen in Hollywood when it comes to protecting certain individuals. Over my tenor of being in the social media industry, I have definitely discovered that it's not about what you know, it definitely is about who you know. When it comes to people getting away with so many different terrible things, it is mainly just about do you know a certain individual and will that person help you? Have you created a bond strong enough in the past to help these people basically exonerate your bad name in the public eye? And if you do have that connection, you're going to be fine. For example, of course, this is a very different crime, but Logan Paul was, of course, exposed for scamming his audience millions upon millions of dollars. He promised to pay back those people that lost their money, and he still, to this time of recording, has not done that. But at the same time, the man is working with world-class footballers on millions of dollars of wages. He's working with top-class football clubs. He's working with KSI, the sidemen. Yet he manages to get away with all of that, despite this thing only recently happening. And how is that? Of course, it comes down to who you know, rather than just what you know. This is a very dark industry when you get involved. It's very creepy, you hear a lot of rumours, and I think with Colleen Ballinger and James Charles, it is just another example when it comes to these media pieces of bad people being protected because of who they know. I'm not saying that everybody can't make a mistake, I'm not saying that somebody can't do something bad, but when it comes to James, when it comes to Colleen, what they have done is, is a cr crime. It's a crime. And that's not, you know, uh, spilling the tea or something. No, it's they've, they've broken the law. The, the, Colleen has sent explicit images of Trisha Paytas to a minor and got away with it. James Charles has obviously done this and has gotten away with it. I laugh because it's obviously so unbelievably insane and so unbelievably dark and creepy. But with that, I think we actually need to take a look at this article and what is actually in it because now of course we've built up the theory that there is a weird creepy connection going on here and now i think it is time that we actually ana I, I, I can't speak english analyze this and go through what has actually been said. Colleen Ballinger has been a YouTube star for more than a decade, amassing tens of millions of followers, many of whom found her when they were teenagers or even younger. Isn't that an ominous way to start it, given where it's gonna go? They found hard for her petty comedy and specifically her fictional alter ego, which we've discovered in this video probably definitely is not completely fictional. Sorry, I'll stop interrupting now. Uh, yeah, they found hard for her fictional Rigo Miranda sings a talentless adolescent I mean you can say that again sorry Sorry, I'll, I'll stop but you can say that again a talentless adolescent who delusionally believes she can sing just you, you just you just set me up you just you just set me up Sorry, I, I, I want to read this I really do I die for Despite the fact she's always off-key, the person owner, I can't read English, res resonated with outcast kids who found her desperate desire for fame to be oh so accurately cringe. You just, you just, why are you setting me up so easily here? You, this is the worst part about this article. The, 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 from the very get-go, it's, it's actually kind of spot on with everything that they're saying. It's just after this, it just 
all completely goes downhill. Such success and Ballinger and Netflix series sold out live shows and most recently, rapidly intensifying controversy. So yes, as I said, this is a pretty regular introduction to an article that kind of setting up the groundwork. There's nothing particularly spicy here. This is where it is probably at its best in the article, but then of course it just goes completely obviously down the utter to those steeped in the world of YouTube fandom, a chaotic, shape-shifting minefield where allegiances are fortified and swapped by the hour, many of these claims were not new. Ballinger had even already responded to some of them on YouTube, of course. Now here, they are referring to the YouTube video that Colleen made in 2020. Now in my second video, I showed that that video was complete and utter bollocks. The entire video was Colleen taking things out of context, using things in ways where they were not originally presented, and completely manipulating the situation and outright lying to her audience. So it's insane to me that this journalist would even try to say, oh yeah, uh, she spoke about it in, in her video previously without, you know, kindly mentioning that that video was absolutely terrible and years later, everybody has said, yeah, that video, it wasn't a good response. Rolling Stone's piece was tame and legally sound, one could argue, compared to the language and rumors that have been flying around her for years. Um, what do you mean by that? Now, from just reading that second paragraph alone, you can pretty much take a lot of passive aggressive language. And I think it comes back to the connection that I mentioned earlier, because why is this journalist so unbelievably ambitious? passionately upset about these allegations. They mention the video, which was obviously a terrible video. They mention the rumors, but they don't mention the fact that there were plenty of screenshots to prove these rumors were not rumors and were actual facts. Why are they getting so passionately defensive about this? It is very suspicious, especially when you equate everything that we previously spoke about for the last 20 minutes. Yet its publication, The Rolling Stones, proceeded to starker allegations against Ballinger getting similarly ushered into the mainstream press. A few days after that, the Rolling Stone piece went live. Huffington Post published its own investigation report. Her fans say she groomed them as teens. In the ensuing weeks, Ballinger would be accused of everything, from performing a Beyonce song in blackface as Miranda sings, to texting a worker's nude photo to a minor. Now, what I find interesting about this is they don't name the person whose photo was there. They don't name that it was Trisha Paytas. They don't name that it was a friend. A, honestly, in my opinion, based on the fact that they had an actual platform together, a good friend. I know that Trisha has argued in the past she wasn't exactly close to Colleen, but they had a podcast together. They had worked together in the past, conversed together, and hung out. So to me personally, they're there was a personal connection there, and they, for some reason, didn't mention that in the article. Because of course, this in my opinion, is a PR piece. It's designed to make Colleen look much better, and it's designed to make these allegations look much worse. Because if you looked at this article right now, you would probably be a little bit impartial. You'd probably be thinking, oh, it's somebody that has been lied about or something on those lines, when the reality is, is this is honestly just a lie. How this is being presented right now, in my opinion, is just a complete fabrication of the truth. Ballinger's legal team has denied she performed in blackface, saying that she was wearing green face paint for prior cover of a song from Wicked. Now, yes, this did happen, and we have actually spoken about this in this video, but I think any good journalist would also mention that the lawyers have never actually released a massive statement coming out and speaking about all of the allegations at once. The serious allegations, not the blackface allegations, which of course are serious, but when it comes to actually committing a crime on the level of the stuff to do with Adam McIntyre, I, I, I believe that that could actually get her in jail if it was actually investigated properly. Both allegations are very serious, but the fact that they have not responded to the ones which can't be disproven says a lot to me, and I think it should say a lot to any impartial journalist, but of course, in my opinion, this journalist is not impartial. Her Sings tour has been since cancelled, and her career abruptly stalled. When 
reached for comment, Ballinger's lawyers replied in an email that Vanity Fair's inquiries were simply a regurgitation of the baseless and substantiated claims that other media outlets and individuals on social media have reported previously. Now, to me personally, if I was to ask a lawyer the questions that they asked the lawyers of Colleen Ballinger and they gave me that response, I would be incredibly suspicious and it would put me on even more of an offensive to find out the truth because that is a very vague statement. It doesn't disprove anything. It just kind of concludes everything in this situation is one big rumor. And I think any journalist would hear that and think, I need to look into this further and get to the bottom of the truth. When the reality is, though, this journalist does seemingly the complete opposite of that. Especially when you go back and look into the finer details of how this article even came to be. Because yes, it is very suspicious. There are clearly some odd things going on here. And earlier, I previously referred to the fact that the Vanity Fair article journalist reached out to the lawyers of Colleen Ballinger, and Vanity Fair have had a history of doing that, which is obviously, from a journalist's perspective, completely understandable. They want to get the perspective of everybody involved in this situation, but that did not happen here, because yes, they reached out to the lawyers of Colleen, but they didn't actually reach out to Adam McIntyre, not just an interview, but just a comment. They did not reach out once. And I didn't get reached out to for a comment, and the, the article is incredibly defamatory towards my character and paints the situation in a completely inappropriate and wrong way. I have a lot I want to talk about about the response to the article, but I want to say something very clear at the start of this video, and this makes me very nervous to say. However, there is very little right now that I can say in regards to the article because I gave Vanity Fair 24 hours to reach out to me to make a comment and correct this, and they chose not to do that. So this is now... This is now going a lot further than what I thought it was going to. Um, and my day today was a lot of phone calls and a lot of meetings. And I can't really speak about anything further than that. They were given the opportunity. My mother has been reaching out to the journalist. Um, I have been putting posts out, you know, directly tagging the journalist. I have given Vanity Fair 24 hours to respond or correct it or make a statement and they are refusing to do that. Now, just from a journalistic perspective alone, this is absolutely insane. He's reached out to the lawyers of Colleen Ballinger, but he has not reached out to the other side of the argument. That is absolutely wild. If you're not going to reach out to people, that, that that's fine. If you're gonna just write an opinion piece, I can understand that. But if you're going to start reaching out and doing interviews, as a journalist, you should have the due diligence to do the groundwork, to reach out to Adam, to reach out to other victims, to reach out to everybody, but they have not done that. And that makes this article oh so much more suspicious and plays into what we were previously speaking about before we even went through this. But then it gets even weirder when Adam in that same video realized that he was actually blocked by the journalist. Did he delete it? Is it deleted now or something? Is it deleted or am I blocked? It better be deleted because let me tell you something. If he's blocked me, if he's blocked me, let me fact check this first. His, he blocked me. Okay, let me tell you something. Let me tell you so I can't even say, I can't even. We, we gave him the opportunity to reach out to me for comment and he blocked me. Now there's nothing more I can really say here other than this is just absolutely wild. I'm genuinely so confused to what is going on here. Something just oozes of something wrong. I don't know how to really put it, but the fact that he wasn't reached out to, he's blocked. I don't know, something is very, very suspicious here. And it only gets worse as you read further into this article, which we're gonna continue with now. The reality of some of these claims, and in turn, the broader narrative around Ballinger remains murky. Various allegations remain unverified, left to endlessly circulate as they fall under the ever-expanding umbrella of inappropriate behavior. Now again, I have to say for the third time, 
what do you mean by that? The ever-expanding umbrella. No, no, no. It was never an ever-expanding umbrella to not send this to a child. Okay? There, there's no umbrella here. We're not, not only crazy analogies to say that this thing right here is obviously a bad thing. And I don't know why we are saying this. Well, obviously not, but this journalist, I don't know why they're saying this. And seemingly trying to kind of uh, say that this whole Colleen Ballinger thing, in my, in my opinion, they're saying that it's cancel culture, I guess. Because what they're describing here really doesn't seem to be the thing that I've been describing for the last six hours over these videos. In a sense, this is a familiar story for the social media age, but Ballinger's downfall is unique. She brought to into an adult world and made it feel like it was theirs, then saw those fans turn against her. Again, I don't believe that this is an accurate portrayal of what actually happened here. I think, as they described there, yes, she brought young fans into an adult world, which is inappropriate. She did that by sending these messages, getting involved in things like this, being in these group chats, saying and doing horrible things like this. But for some reason, this journalist is absolutely insisting on betraying it in some form of innocent manner. Like, oh, you know, she gave them the world and they turned against her. The reason that these people are now against Colleen Ballinger is because they grew up and matured and become an adult where they realized that how they were being treated as a child by an adult was wrong. And they realized that because they probably thought to themselves, if they, who were now an adult, did what will happen to them as a child, that would be obviously very wrong. And I love that in this article, they're basically just making it out like this is just a Colleen Ballinger thing. Like if it was anybody else, you know, there wouldn't be this much of a reaction, which actually isn't true, because right now there is another ongoing situation attached to this situation with a person called Johnny Silvestri. Now, we will go further into this later in the video, but this is somebody who originally spoke up against Colleen Ballinger as a supposed ex-fan, but in the last week, it's been exposed that Johnny Silvestri was doing a lot of terrible things, and he is now at the forefront of controversy being criticized, being exposed, and receiving the same treatment that Colleen Ballinger is receiving. This isn't to do with an individual, this isn't to do with bias, this isn't to do with agendas, this is to do with people wanting justice. If this was not Colleen Ballinger and it was another influencer, we would be saying the same things. For example, I mentioned James Charles earlier, and with him, we say the exact same things. But shockingly enough, ladies and gentlemen, after this, it only continues to get worse, where they seemingly bring in the conversation of tea spilling on YouTube and kind of use it as a way to blame everybody else in this situation. And I'm just really confused why everybody else is receiving flack here, but Colleen, the one that actually caused all of these situations to happen, like, let's get this straight here. Colleen did the things that she is now being criticized for and facing consequences for. But if you read this article, you think it's like there was this group collective where all the angry tea spill channels got together to, to bring down Colleen Ballinger for no reason. And the, the reality is, is that's absolutely not true. And in fact, for years, as I've said throughout these videos, Adam McIntyre was victim blamed and, and laughed at and called a liar. And only this year has the truth actually got out. If there was this massive conspiracy where everybody was against Colleen, I think it would have happened three or four years ago, but it's only now happening. And in fact, there really hasn't been any justice whatsoever. It's just been people on the internet saying, oh yeah, Colleen Ballinger is a bit of a dick. Like, that's all that's really happened. There hasn't been any legal repercussions. There hasn't been any financial compensation or anything like that. It's just been somebody getting called a dick on the internet, which is hilarious because these journalists try to signal that like as some form of massive cancellation when the reality is is everybody just has an opinion and that's it. Colleen can still live in a million dollar mansion with a million dollars in the bank with her deals with certain companies and stuff like that. She will be fine but the problem is is people like Colleen, people in the media cannot handle it when certain people have opinions. It's a product of a particular era of YouTube star of digital personas able to cultivate a feverish and savvy fandom that's been trained to reverse course and maybe seek 
payback with the first spilling of tea. And again, I think this is a completely inaccurate representation of what has actually happened in this situation. Yes, Colleen Ballinger did cultivate an audience, and I do think that probably was deliberate. I don't think that there was some grand master plan of how she would control everybody. I think she just cultivated it deliberately. She deliberately tried to make it so she was close to her audience so she could get away with so much, but I don't think there was some written out plan. So what's being betrayed here is is it's that, but in form of like an innocent way of, oh, you know, she, she was just close to the fans and stuff like that, but then they randomly wanted revenge. Well, but what did they want revenge for? And that actually gets into the people that originally called out Colleen in the situation, Adam McIntyre. This is when we get into the section of the article where a lot of people have seen the victim blaming go from bad to absolute worse. One could be forgiven if you were one of the millions who back in the summer of 2020 allayed some COVID anxiety by diving into the YouTube drama unfolding between Ballinger and her former friend Adam McIntyre. I love that they present it like it's dirty to consume this content despite they themselves are a part of Vanity Fair, a company known for speaking about social media things, celebrities, drama, stuff like that. And they're trying to make you feel a little bit bad. Oh, you know, you were cooped up indoors, so it's fine. But now, you know, now it's dirty. The reality is, is this isn't drama. This is people consuming information where most people at one point, well, not most, but a lot of people were fans of Colleen and they now feel betrayed and some even have very familiar experiences to certain people involved and they want to get their voice out there. So YouTubers, other journalists who actually have credibility have spoken about this so victims can actually be listened to. So yeah, it says uh, you can dive into the YouTube drama unfolding between Ballinger and her former fan Adam McIntyre, a then 17-year-old. Ballinger was his idol. Her merch could be seen all over the Irish teenager's bedroom where he recorded his own videos. He was an inspiring influencer himself, making sweet low-stakes YouTube content about his life. On June the 22nd, McIntyre posted a video to his channel titled Colleen Ballinger Stop Lying. In it, Adam told several seemingly unrelated stories. Immediately, going just into the video from the very get-go, there is a passive aggressive nature. Personally, I think everything that Adam said in that video was completely and absolutely relative. It told the story of his connection to Colleen, his friendship with Colleen, his relationship with her, and I think that is vital. It wasn't just a case of, here's this screenshot, here's this screenshot, and here's this screenshot. It was somebody that had been genuinely affected by somebody as a young person. They had been badly affected by a grown adult who had treated them horribly. And I think how Adam presented the story in his original video all the way back in 2020 was genuinely brilliant. As a victim, as somebody who has clearly gone through a lot, has clearly been silenced, I think the story was presented perfectly. You can't expect a victim in any situation to come onto their YouTube channel like me, a commentary channel, being like, here's the facts, this is why this thing is bad. No. I think genuine authenticity comes from when somebody actually speaks their truth, speaks about all of the context in the story, and lets you know how they got in that place in the first place and what came from that relationship or friendship with any victim. I don't expect them to just spit out facts and that's it. I expect some personal things to be said. So this style of journalism here is incredibly victim blamey and just shows that they do not care about the people that have been affected in this situation. Situation. It's honestly grim, but as I said, this is just the beginning of where they speak about Adam. One of the stories recounted the time Ballinger sent him lingerie in the mail. To his mother's horror, the lingerie was new and unwore, and Ballinger has since apologized for sending it. Again, again, this is just absolutely insane. They're like, oh yeah, it's fine that the 30-year-old sent the teenager uh, underwear because it was unworn. You know, it's definitely not weird that some random internet celebrity was sending children her lingerie. Do you even hear what you're saying? This is absolutely embarrassing journalism, and I genuinely can't believe this article has not been retracted with a public apology. If we're going to speak about drama and people covering the drama or in, in the social media space, the thing we should be covering, and the thing a lot of people have covered at this point, is that this journalist should genuinely be ashamed of what they have written here. Another was intended to debunk the rumor that he was secretly behind some anti-Miranda Singh social media accounts that balance 
Ballinger had gotten wind of. A third concerned the fallout of a tweet that Ballinger allowed McIntyre to post as Miranda Sings from the character's Twitter account that led him to never posting on her behalf again. He'd been considered her social media intern, he said, with hopes of being employed by her one day in that capacity. Ballinger said he had only had access to her account for one day and that it all went well, she had planned to hire him formally. The tweet in question was seized upon as queer baiting by Miranda's fandom. She came out as a Megan Trainer fan and it led to intense backlash. Again, this journalism here takes away so much context from the situation, takes from the fact that for months, Adam had been providing content in DMs to Colleen Ballinger. It, it almost presents it like Adam was just like this bratty little fan who would message Colleen constantly and she would, you know, she would interact on like uh, from a very standoffish perspective. But the reality is, as we all know, as, as everybody that has consumed this information over the last three months, that that is complete and utter bollocks. And, I, and I'm genuinely dumbfounded by the fact, I don't say dumbfounded often, I am dumbfounded by the fact that a journalist genuinely wrote this and thought that people wouldn't call them out on it. And it only goes back to the connection that I mentioned earlier. That is the only genuinely logical thing that I can put to this to understand why that this was made. I don't believe that an unbiased journalist would make this article with all the previous history of Vanity Fair and Colleen Ballinger blocking Adam McIntyre. I don't believe that an unbiased journalist would do any of that. And I think that they would actually do their due diligence when it comes to actually getting the story right and getting the context and the facts out there. It might sound strange to hear that Ballinger had to put a fan in charge of her character's Twitter to begin with, but that access went in line with her public image. Ballinger was closely aligned with her most devoted young viewers. And you are presenting that as a normal thing? This is the thing, even when there's something where it's like, oh, I actually don't know how I can defend it, they just, instead of like actually putting a justification, they just put a nice little spin on it, you know, oh, well, she was like, you know, always closely devoted to a young audience or something like that. That's the excuse for anything that happened in this situation. Being close with your audience is replying to a few tweets. And yes, maybe you were added to a group chat. And maybe, you know, you could put in, hi, hope you're having a nice day or something on those lines. But we all know that it absolutely was not the case. There are now archives upon archives of things that have been said by Killing Ballinger in these group chats to her fans in personal DMs. She's been exposed for manipulating other fans who spoke about this situation with Adam McIntyre into making videos attacking Adam McIntyre, yet this journalist fails to mention absolutely any of that. And even if you don't think that Killing Ballinger should be in a jail cell, throw away, lock the keys, stuff like that, even if you don't think that, surely you should have, like, a, a, at least some, like, oh, you know, I, I, I can understand why people are mad at her. You know, yeah, I'm a fan of her, and yeah, we, you know, I'm being paid up. Oh, obviously, I don't know if that's true. But, you know, even if you were, like, this massive super fan of her, and you're being a bit defensive in a situation, surely, as an adult, you can understand why she is receiving criticism. But the only person that seemingly is receiving criticism in this article is, again... Adam McIntyre. McIntyre appeared to seize on this, accusing Ballinger's brother's family, the Ballinger family, who have a family oriented channel, of endangering and exploiting their children online. How creepy that I feel I watched them grow up, he said. It's disgusting. His critique gave way to a denunciation of family channels more broadly. Which honestly, I don't understand why this is even being mentioned, because yes, I personally think that family channels, for the most part, are very inappropriate and I think that those channels rely on recording their children. They rely on getting clicks from their children and it always seems to lead to some form of exploitation. But here it's weird to me because they're criticizing Adam for saying something in a video where he is given an opinion but they haven't criticized Colleen Ballinger for saying certain things in DMs to minors. Certain things like <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not even going to read it out but Certain things like this. Why was this never mentioned? But even after this, they say, but on June the 7th, McIntyre posted an anti-Ballinger video, as he does ever so often. Anti-Ballinger makes it sound like some weird political movement, but the fact of the matter is, is somebody who had Colleen Ballinger being very inappropriate to them when they were like 14 years old, 
doesn't like Colleen Ballinger. That's not being an anti. That's just somebody coming from a very understandable perspective. Then it casually says McIntyre and another former fan have alleged that Ballinger sent them nude photos from a sex worker, posting unverified if troubling text messages as proof. They've posted the proof. And you're still saying that they're unverified. I mean, I'm sorry, but every single theory that we said at the beginning of this, I, you can't help but start to think even more that surely those are true. What do you mean by unverified? You yourself have confirmed that they have tweeted evidence of this, yet you're still acting like it's bollock. I mean, how much needs to happen for this journalist to understand that these things are absolutely verified? I mean, what makes this even more insane is that Elon Musk of all people, yes, Elon Musk, actually is on the side of Adam McIntyre in this debacle. Because after they deleted the original tweet where they got a lot of backlash for the caption of the tweet, yes, I, I forgot to mention that, of course, they deleted it. They acknowledged that what they said in that original tweet was, of course, wrong and out of pocket and just absolutely obscene, but they brushed it under the carpet and they made a new tweet which got community noted by Twitter. Oh or X. Colleen Ballinger's inappropriate sexual and offensive behavior is in her content and live shows. Adam McIntyre's claims have been verified by witnesses, other people have come forward with their experiences with her, and the evidence intensified because of her response song. And you know when <laughs> X is against you, Elon Musk is against you in this, you must have definitely done something wrong because you're making me agree with the bloke and agree with that god-awful platform. Do you know how obscene that is? That you've got basically the entire internet speaking up against you. And as it said, surely, surely the ukulele response video is just not the most slam-dunk form of evidence to do with pretty much everything that she's been accused of in this situation. But for this journalist, apparently not. Apparently the unbiased and totally reputable journalist. It just so happens to think that everything is, is false and unverified. So let's continue and see what else they have to say. Back then, a teenager McIntyre perhaps hoped for sympathy. I'm not even going to respond to that. Another chance, a way back into the Ballinger fold. This is absolutely not true. Adam McIntyre made his video about Colleen Ballinger, was called a liar, was called a gossip, was called dramatic and all the other words under the sun, and Adam for the last three years stood firm against Colleen Ballinger. I can confirm that because I have seen all of the videos Adam has posted about Colleen in the last few years. Every so often, he would speak about the situation, and up until recently, he would still be called out for it. I don't think that Adam McIntyre has ever been desperate to get back into the fold of Colleen Ballinger. In fact, I would go as far as to say as that's just a complete outright lie and fabrication of the truth. The internet is generally too cruel for that, its judgement too swift, but one can look for the de-evolution of the Miranda Singh's empire and see the longer it drags out, the harder it is to pin down the exact truth. Justifiable outrage turns to silly memes and headlines and videos. It's quite crazy to me that they say justifiable outrage after saying everything that they said in this article. Of course I should just say that everything that I have said about this article is my opinion, and my opinion is that this article is an absolute disgrace and just complete and utter garbage. Somebody who wrote this should just be embarrassed that they studied at university for years. They paid thousands, tens of thousands of dollars to get their journalism degree, and this was the result of it. Just diarrhea on a web page, but it only continues. If there's one thing that the saga of Colleen Ballinger and her fans has taught us, is that today's winner on YouTube is tomorrow's loser. No, that's absolutely not the case. There are so many YouTubers out there that have been around for the last 15 years that are still famous to this day. I mean, off the top of my head, Markiplier, for example, one of the most loved YouTubers of the last 10 years. I remember when this dude was popular when I was still in school, and he is still just as, if not more popular, to this day. But the key fact is, is these YouTubers that are still beloved, 
did not do this. Now what are you doing? What are you doing? Stop! No! Oh god! The phrase of today's hero is tomorrow's villain or whatever it I can't even bother bother to look. I because every time I look at the article, I just get the, the stench of absolute shit going into my nostrils. I don't want to reread it, but that phrase at the ending or whatever they wrote down, absolute garbage and a complete utter lie. Honestly, I could rant and rave about how disgraceful this article is for the rest of this video, but I think it is more important to actually again speak about the connection here, how this article came to be. As we've seen, this entire thing is so unbelievably weird and suspicious. I don't think that I've ever seen a PR piece quite like this, and when you add everything together, when you add in the fact that Adam was blocked, when you add in the fact that Vanity Fair have contact with Colleen's lawyers, and all of the other previous things that are just very weird with this situation, everything starts to feel very dark and eerie. And even when Adam reached out after he was blocked, after he saw this hit piece, even when he asked for a retraction or some form of an update, he was still ignored. So this was last night. We'll now be issuing to Vanity Fair to review the facts that have been made available for a month and a half now and make them, and they have to make a correction or a retraction and we'll go from there. They refuse to do that. So obviously it's going further. Now I want to Honestly, this is absolutely horrific, but honestly, it just mainly confuses me. Why are Vanity Fair so defiant in standing by Colleen Ballinger? They will argue in the future that they didn't do that, but just reading through the context of everything that we've looked at throughout this article, it's very clear where their allegiances lie. And as a journalist, I think that's absolutely pathetic because journalists shouldn't have allegiances. They should be coming at this to discover the actual truth. I'm not saying that need to stand by completely against Colleen, but at least come up this from a middle ground to understand what is happening here. But this article is obviously not that, and of course now people around the world are speculating. Was this a favor? Were they paid to do this? Obviously these questions will be asked for months to come in this situation, and I doubt we will ever know the truth. Personally, I think this was a journalist doing a favor for somebody that they like, somebody that they think is a great content creator, something on those lines, and it is somebody who most likely had some form of connection to Colleen or the people that represent her. Of course, that is just my opinion, but this article is a bigger representation of how strange and eerie the situation is gradually getting. One thing with this article which I mentioned was how it tries to present everybody speaking about Colleen as some biased people who are basically just speculating over tons of rumors and it tries to paint out people like me people like you people like adam as people who are just completely against colleen no matter what people that will do anything if it means that colleen will lose her empire but the fact of the matter is is right now there is now an other ongoing investigation attached to the situation with somebody called johnny silvestri that i mentioned earlier and this situation is a direct direct contradiction to everything stated in this article. This new situation right now shows that people care about the facts. They care about getting justice and if somebody will take a situation and use it to their own benefit by spreading actual lies, they will face the consequences. And that's exactly what is happening right now. But this journalist will not say anything like that. They won't make articles about it because it doesn't obviously suit their agenda. If they can't paint people out to look bad in this situation, they won't say anything about it. But the fact is, people clearly do care about the facts, and that's why we're now going to speak about this Johnny Silvestri situation, because in every single scandal on the internet, there are always going to be opportunists that take advantage of a situation to use it to their own benefit, and this is another case of that. This is a case of this Colin Ballinger scandal being taken and used by somebody else in order to gain social media popularity and it has basically skewed everything in this investigation to look even more insane. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in this part of the story, this is where things go from weird to just absolutely insane. This part of the story is where the story just starts to go into multiple separate avenues. It's like spin-offs. There is a different thing for every single little thing that has happened so far in this story. This is when it all actually comes back to rather than just Colleen, but it actually goes back to Colleen Ballinger's 
own community. Because throughout this story, we have spoken about people who were in Colleen's community at very young ages, who grew up and spoke about their stories and experiences in the Colleen Ballinger community. And naturally, over the last few months, you, me, your nan and granddad, we've all heard of these stories. YouTubers like myself and just in general, people with an account on social media have spoken about these stories, tried to uplift victims and get their messages out there in the world. This has been a time where so many people have finally been listened to because as we've gone through in this whole story, so many people have been silenced, called liars, called gossipers, but now finally in 2023, the lies, the manipulation, the deceit, the weird things behind the scenes has all been exposed and it has finally allowed people to get their truth out there in the world and be heard by millions. But with that, in every story where people are speaking up and getting their truth out there, comes the sad reality of opportunism. And with that, damage is done to real victims. Now, we mentioned in the previous part the story of James Charles. Of course, this man was accused of some very real things, but at the same time, James now has a list of accusations against him which are just complete outright fabrications. These things did not happen, but it was because a, a small social media account, or just in general an anonymous account, wanted to get a little bit of attention during a time of where victims were being listened to. And naturally, because of that, a lot of people were just seeing any old story without any forms of evidence, any forms of actual interactions between them and James and believing it, retweeting it and sharing it and this damaged the story outright because as we saw in the previous article that I briefly mentioned, James now uses those false accusations as a way to kind of deflect from the real allegations and as I've always said throughout all of these videos, if you have 99 false allegations, it does not matter if you have one real accusation. But obviously the problem is, is those 99 accusations blur the water, they make things murky, they make people question the genuine, authentic accusations, and sadly, this is where things start to go very, very weird with this story, and it introduces us to Johnny Silvestri, who I previously mentioned. Now, understandably, if you don't know who this individual is, Johnny Silvestri is a 27-year-old man currently at the absolute forefront of controversy, now being dubbed as somebody who was worse than Colleen Ballinger. Every single day at this point, it seems that more and more people are speaking against Johnny, more evidence is coming out, and more exposés are coming out and speaking against this person and the alleged horrible things that he has done. And now the question is, well, what is happening? And how does this actually all relate to Colleen? And why are we now discussing it? Well, actually, no, that may not be the question. In fact, in fact, most of you probably already know this information. I'm, I'm highly aware that this video is coming out very late in this story and you've probably all moved on but the, the, the first thing we should explore is not why this is attached to Colleen but actually now we know who Johnny is this 27 year old girl we should know now why we know who Johnny is and that takes us all the way back to a decade ago years ago because pretty much before all of the recent controversy Johnny Silvestri was known as an aspiring influencer who was mainly known for being a former super fan of Colleen Ballinger somebody who is absolutely embedded in the Ballinger community to the point of where he was involved in Colleen's live shows, he had Colleen Ballinger's phone number, and he was even thanked in Colleen Ballinger's Netflix special and even had his own subsection of fan base in the Ballinger community. This person did not just look up to Colleen, but he also had the benefit of making and building his own fan base from Colleen Ballinger and everything that she had created. This is a man who was known absolutely Absolutely, extremely well in the Ballinger community, from being in group chats to live streams to producing content to just in general being associated with Colleen Ballinger. And you may be now thinking, oh, well, obviously he isn't a super fan anymore, and that was a thing deep in the past, but actually, no, that's not the case. It wasn't like when Adam came out of his original allegation in 2020, Johnny was like, okay, I'm no longer a part of this. Uh, no, no, no. Johnny in 2023 was actually still trying to, I guess, rekindle his friendship with Colleen Ballinger. I had just gone to a Miranda show two months ago. I was still attempting to salvage any relationship that was left. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I feel like there are two very interesting facts that we can take from this. Fact number one being... <laughs> 
Johnny Silvestri is probably the only human being above the age of 21 that has actually been to a Miranda Sings live show, because, ladies and gentlemen, if, if you're an adult going to this live, like, I'm not even trying to be mean, it's just not very, it's it's just not humour for adults, well it is, but it isn't, like, obviously everything that we've gone through indicates that it absolutely is humour for adults, but the problem is, is the jokes aren't for anybody, the kids shouldn't be exposed to it, but adults shouldn't be exposed to it either, because it's just so chronically unfunny, and I feel the fact that this man was still going to these live shows in 2023 as a 27 or 26 year old man says a lot for the rest of this story, but then we move on to fact number two, which is Johnny was still a fan of Colleen in 2023, and that immediately throws us back to 2020, because what I'm trying to establish to you all now is the groundworks to who this person is before we get into the recent story. He is a super fan up until this year. I will say that again, and then I will throw back to this tweet in 2020, where Colleen Ballinger tweeted out her response to Adam McIntyre, and as you can see in this tweet right here, Johnny was somebody still standing by Colleen Ballinger, despite everything that Adam McIntyre said in his video in 2020. Now, obviously, throughout everything we have spoken about manipulation and deceit and how Colleen Ballinger obviously manipulated her fan base against people like Adam, but I definitely think if you're around the age of 23 slash 24, which I believe Johnny was at this point of time, I think that you should be able to uh, kind of work out what is, what is wrong and what is right, especially with this, with with this woman sending underwear to a child, I don't think that no matter what she says in your defense, you should be then putting out a tweet of support. And I think this shows everything that we need to know about Johnny Silvestri. Of course, people make mistakes, but given all of the information that has come out about this guy, he obviously remained supportive. He obviously remained dedicated to Killeen Ballinger. But now we've got the groundworks established of who Johnny is and what he represents in this story, I want to move back to the year of 2023, because obviously this is the year of Killeen's downfall, of all of the allegations finally getting spoken about, victims finally getting listened to, and Johnny is so interesting in this story, because obviously we've just seen this guy was this year still going to her shows, despite so obviously knowing about everything that was happening in Colleen's community between 2016 and maybe before to 2023, and in this story, he has changed his mind despite still going to her live show in 2023. Yes, Johnny Silvestri over the last few months has been one of the most vocal people to speak against Colleen Ballinger, despite what I have shown you. You have seen his supportive tweet of her. You have seen the 2023 concert visit, and I know I keep repeating that, but this is what makes it strange from the very get-go, but then it gets even more absurd. Because shortly after the allegations going viral again, Johnny then accused Trent Ballinger of being a groomer, and most significantly, Joshua Evans, Colleen's ex-husband, of being a groomer and grooming him. And ladies and gentlemen, naturally, when these allegations came out, people were very supportive of Johnny Silvestri, because that's just how it works, you know? A victim speaks up, well, I should say an alleged victim speaks up, they try to get their truth out there, and in a situation where other victims are speaking up, this would be the moment for people that have been hiding in secret to come out and speak about what has happened to them. So people were very open to listening to what Johnny had to say, and that is exactly what happened. For months, this guy was spoken about, people support his tweets, even apologies by the people that were accusing him were made, which makes it obviously seem that, oh, well, you know, everything what he said seemed to be true. There was nothing suspicious going on here, and this is just another case of somebody being manipulated for an entire decade in the Ballinger community to say nothing and act like everything was absolutely fine. But you and me now know, especially you guys, because I am again very late to this topic, we all know that this obviously is not the truth. Some things, well, a lot of things in this situation are very weird, very insane, and it is an absolute reflection of 
everything that happened in Colleen Ballinger's community. Because as time went on and as more as the community were discussing these events and discussing the allegations that have come out, not just about Colleen but about the people in her family and the people that were a part of her family years ago, people started to get a little bit confused. As I said, vague apologies were made but the community gradually became a little bit split about what was truly going on here. Things were being said behind the scenes and the actual overall understanding of how old Johnny was at the point of where he was quote-unquote groomed was in contention, but not just because of his age, but also because people genuinely weren't actually sure what happened between Johnny Silvestri and Colleen's ex-husband, Joshua Evans. Despite people were asking questions and asking for screenshots, there was never really anything to put out concrete of what really happened between the two and naturally this led to a lot of conversation. You see with all the other victims involved in this situation it seems that when they came out and spoke about their truth they posted a lot of evidence and they directly say what happened in the horrible circumstances that they were previously involved in. But with Johnny Silvestri, there really seemed to be absolutely nothing other than the phrase of this person groomed me, which obviously is a very serious allegation and does need some level of explanation. And a lot of people out there, particularly people on Reddit, started to question Johnny's story. Some people started to do their own research and a few people even started realizing some parts of this story are not just strange, but they just absolutely weren't adding up. And then this leads us to the recent developments. This leads us to one of the, strangely enough, biggest players in this story. Because people like me, commentators, we're just here to kind of tell the events of what has happened and give in our opinion here and there. That's what we love to do. We're basically like YouTube journalists. But what happens when one YouTube, I guess, journalist gets actually involved in the story almost accidentally? Well, that is when we have the story of Swoop. Because on August the 17th, 2023, Swoop dropped the third part of her Colleen Ballinger series titled The Devil in Colleen Ballinger's Shadow. He lied to everyone. And ladies and gentlemen, this video has seemingly changed everything in this situation. Of course, all of the allegations towards Colleen are still absolutely valid, if not even more valid with what we're about to go into, but naturally with things like this, it does cause people to question the credibility of victims, and I don't think that's fair, but the reason for this is because of how sinister this story truly gets. From small amounts of suspicion to do with the puzzles not adding up in Johnny's own allegations to heavy levels of serious allegations towards Johnny of some of the worst possible things, but also lying, manipulation of the truth, and doctoring evidence, but also some of the most sinister things that you could possibly imagine. Some things which, as I said, have made people say that Johnny Silvestri is as bad as Colleen, if not worse. And as I mentioned earlier, there are allegations made which are sometimes false in big situations where those allegations are made to get attention. They are meant to get followers and replies and all of that good social media stuff which, you know, makes you feel great. But the problem is is I don't believe that this is just what this story is about. I don't believe that this is just about getting numbers on social media. I think that definitely is a part of it, but I also think this is about protecting certain individuals in the story. And ladies and gentlemen, this is where we get into it. And I think it is quite ironic that journalists have kind of centered this whole story like we're only focusing on Colleen Ballinger, when the reality is, is people just care about the truth. And when it comes to getting the truth, we need to speak about these very important things like this story right here. Because as I said, this has put a lot of people's credibility on the line, whether that's right or wrong. So yeah, let's get into this. So yes, as we know, Johnny Silvestri accused Colleen's ex-husband of grooming, but also Trent Ballinger of grooming. And this wasn't just like he made one random tweet. No, no, no. According to Swoop herself, he made 40 plus tweets 
to do with these allegations. This cycle of Johnny tweeting about Joshua went on for nearly two months every single day almost and became more vicious, more pointed, and more combative no matter what anybody said to him in the comments. This all coming from an adult man who said he wanted to leave Josh alone. I wanted to leave Josh alone. Who then proceeded to tweet accusations at Joshua another 44 times that are still live on Twitter, and this doesn't even include the tweets about Joshua that he deleted. In fact, Johnny didn't let up on tweeting until July 20th, the day that I called Johnny personally to fact check something else concerning about his story, and I believe what I said on the call is the reason that Johnny stopped tweeting about Joshua David Evans for over a week. You may have noticed he got a lot quieter after that call. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I think the question here is how did we actually get to this point? How did we go from these 40 plus allegations to where we are now at in the story? Well, it starts off with the fact that in this video from Swoop, she was very smart. In fact, this is probably one of the best investigations I have ever seen. And yeah, I may have made multiple four hour plus videos, but it is nothing on Swoop's third video in the series. This is genuinely, I'm not even trying to be like overly nice here, but it is such a good video and the reason for that is because she was smart. She investigated and went through interviews of multiple people, including Adam McIntyre, but most importantly, Johnny Silvestri. She did a six hour video of the guy where she spoke from a very level headed perspective. She spoke calmly. And the reason she did that is because when you're not being confrontational and angry and all that stuff of where you want to find all the lies, when you're just being calm and seemingly you like their friends, they will tell the truth to you without even meaning to, because if they're calm and relaxed in a scenario of where they think they're in control, that's when liars love to actually spew the real truth accidentally. And this is something that absolutely happened in this interview between Johnny and Swoop. It's very clear to me that she got everything that she needed to by speaking to him in a very calm and relaxed manner, making him feel like he was in charge of the conversation. And it seems that in this first part of Swoop's video, that the first thing that she wanted to truly establish was what actually actually happened in this relationship between Johnny and Joshua because as I said there is clearly some missing context in this situation to whether they spoke behind closed doors in DMs over social media and what Swoop did here was basically go through all of the interviews of where Johnny has spoken about this Colleen Ballinger situation because he basically went on a press tour giving interviews to people where he was happy to give out all the information from his mind without really providing any screenshots and things really weren't adding up and this is where we can start to establish his relationship with Joshua Evans his real relationship and you guys started texting like on a one-on-one -on -one basis not super regularly because I didn't want to use it. I didn't want to lose this privilege because they like gave you little things, but then would kind of hold it over your head, even if they didn't say it to your face. Now, Johnny did say the majority of their relationship was held publicly over Twitter, not privately. So we needed to look beyond the DMs. How often did you talk? I guess I'm just more curious of the dynamic between you two. It was more so like Twitter based. It was more of a public relationship. But because Johnny deleted most of of his old tweets and he admitted that to us, this is hard to fully investigate. Except if you search for correspondence between at Joshua D Town and Johnny's old username at Johnny Silvestri, uh, you can find that virtually every interaction between the two of them began with Johnny tweeting at Josh and Josh responding meaning that even in a public setting, Joshua was rarely initiating contact. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is obviously very confusing because there is a very heavy accusation that has come here, yet it seems that there really isn't much of an actual friendship here. Now, yes, there are a few interactions here and there, but when you look at something like this, it very much does just seem that Johnny Silvestri is a fan of Joshua and the other Ballingers. Now, of course, this doesn't just describe 
credit his story immediately, things could be happening behind the scenes that we don't realize. But this is the beginning of where things start to get weird. And when it comes to the behind the scenes things, Swoop obviously realized, well, maybe there are some private DMs that we don't know about. So what Swoop actually did was ask Johnny if Johnny could send over his side of his DMs with Joshua. And then she also asked Joshua to send the exact same DMs, but from his own side. And ladies and gentlemen, this is where things get even more fishy. So when Joshua sent over his DMs, it didn't seem like there were any problems. He was keen, he sent them over immediately, and there was no delay. But with Johnny, it was a little bit different. As you can see in these text messages here, it seems like there could be a possible issue with sending over these DMs. Now, he did eventually send over his conversation with Joshua, and Swoop was able to go through these DMs and look through them. And this is where Swoop discovered something extremely suspicious because she had been smart here rather than just asking for Johnny's conversation of course she now has both of them and she can compare them in case there has been doctoring of evidence because of course if somebody was to withhold some form of evidence in the situation it would look very very suspicious it would look like somebody in this situation is lying and that is exactly what happened here now on the left side you can see Josh's side of the DMs which began in in 2012 and on the right you can see Johnny's side of the DMs. I should reiterate again if this is a little bit confusing, these are the same conversations but obviously Josh's mysteriously begins a year earlier to when Johnny's begins in 2013 which obviously makes it look like Johnny has seemingly deleted DMs to make it look like Joshua was the person who first initiated contact but as we can see right Right here that absolutely is not the case and obviously that looks extremely suspicious because now with everybody already wondering things when evidence is being doctored it starts to go into the realms of accusations of lying why would Johnny Silvestri do this? If these were very real allegations, why would he need to do this? Because honestly, I wouldn't even find much of a problem if Johnny was initiating contact in the first place and if these accusations were real. Because of course, he was a super fan. He was somebody that looked up to people like Joshua and Colleen Ballinger. But to then go and actually doctor the evidence, to me personally, immediately makes me think that this person is clearly lying about something. And as Swoop presents more and more messages, you can see that there are more messages missing. In Johnny's DMs, it seems that there is more of an actual back and forth between the two, but then you look at Josh's messages, and it's just Johnny being aired for the majority of the messages. And ladies and gentlemen, I think it's very clear to why Johnny has done this, because of course he wanted to frame Joshua in the worst possible way. And if you look at these DMs, you would think, oh, this is a minor conversing with an adult who yeah, is a super fan of of the adult and that would look a little bit suspicious but it would look very suspicious but of course that is not the truth and I think at this exact moment of Swoop and her team making this discovery it caused them to go into an even deeper detective cycle they went through absolutely everything because why would Johnny be lying in this situation I keep on asking the question and it will eventually somewhat throw back to Colleen Ballinger but I want you to realize the facts and the lies in the situation because of course establishing the truth the actual truth is important and if we are going to do that we need to look at some of the accusations or at least tweets that Johnny was making about Joshua like this I don't care you befriended a 15 year old when you were my age now you effing weirdo now once again it's very clear that Johnny Silvestri is trying to present this whole thing as he was a good friend of Joshua when he was a child and that is why I think we have these fake Dr. DMs. Well, obviously they're not fake, but they are fake in terms of what the conversation is being presented to be. And of course, it seems like a story is being built up here by Johnny Silvestri and that story over the last few months until Swoop's video was eaten up by a lot of people. Now, of course, the question I understand a lot of you will be asking is, well, was Joshua Evans actually completely innocent in this situation? Well, 
well, based on the accusations that Johnny was making, I would say that a lot of these allegations don't exactly seem to be true. And there are some inappropriate things which I think Joshua has done, but I don't really think it constitutes some of the things that Johnny accused him of. And if we are going to say that they are the things that Johnny accused him of, then Johnny himself is also guilty of everything that he is calling Joshua, if not a hundred times worse. And we will get into that, but the thing I'm talking about here that Joshua did, which was inappropriate, was give his phone number to Johnny Silvestri. When he was 16, his family took a vacation to New York City to see a Miranda Sing show because Johnny was a super fan, and he approached Colleen to autograph a paper crown that he had received for participating in the show. It was just a little family vacation we decided to go on and kind of revolve around this trip because I had been speaking to all of my friends and Colleen and Joshua and the whole family for about a year virtually. And she never did shows in Illinois. So it was either you go to New York for one or you go to LA. The reason Josh is so crucial, Joshua David Evans, her ex-husband, is so crucial to my story is because I was not one of the close ones to Colleen at first. Now, according to Johnny, Joshua swooped in and signed it unsolicited, then secretly wrote his phone number and said something like, uh, use this if you need it. And Johnny was confused. Here's how he told the story on the Do We Know Them podcast. New York, I'm, I'm 16, get this, this phone number and this crown that I'm given, right? He, he writes his signature on it after I had won it from being a part of the show. And then he opens it up and writes something in the inside and hands it to me and says, here, use this anytime. Kind of just gives me like a nod of affirmation. And I'm like, what the f and I open and it. He's and he's familiar like, with who you are because you and Colleen chat, had- Tiny chat, yeah. Twitter. Oh, oh yes, of course, from Tiny. <laughs> yeah, um, I texted him that night and I just said, hey, like, thank you so much for giving me this phone number. And I let him, essentially know that I will be respectful of it and only use it if I need. And he sent me something back like, don't worry about it. You're like a little bro to me. If you have any questions about the industry or you ever like want to work on some projects, hit me up. Now, of course, yes, in most cases and scenarios, giving out your phone number to a child fan is obviously going to be an inappropriate thing, which I don't think I can sit here and defend. I don't think that this was something that Joshua should have done. And in fact, Joshua himself admits to this. But at the same time, I don't think that that equates to everything that Johnny Silvestri has called him because there were a lot of things that Swoop started to notice here which Johnny hadn't included in his previous stories because this whole phone number thing seemed to be the main center gravity point of his entire argument to do with Joshua. This was something which he deemed very inappropriate and it seems that a lot of the bad stuff in this story stems from the phone number. What was said in the text messages? What was said in the phone calls? And we will get to that, but something Swoop noticed at first was also Johnny's parents were there when Joshua gave him his phone number. Do you remember what the conversation was that you were having with him right before he put his number in a crown? They were just signing the crown. We were all about to leave. That's around the moment. I'm pretty sure Colleen said something about and my dad was like, what did she just say? And I was like, oh my God, I have Joshua's phone number. Really heard my, or really hope my dad didn't just hear Colleen say. Okay, and so. I, I guess I didn't realize that this was, that your parents uh, were, or at least your dad was there with you at the time that he was writing his phone number in the crown. Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay, let's just stop right here and address the elephant in the room. Something that Johnny has conveniently buried the lead on in every retelling of the story imaginable. Johnny Silvestri's parents were right next to him when he got this phone number from Joshua. Yeah, I'm more clear. I guess I don't know how I, I missed it that your, your family was there. Did yes. your parents, did they know that he had given uh, you his number. He gave me the crown, gave me that little nod of affirmation. My first initial response was, I don't want the other people to see that I just got this phone number because then everybody's going to flock and try to get it from me or like steal this crown. And now, I noticed that I had to ask Johnny multiple times about his parents being there and witnessing this because he would continuously steer the conversation away from that. So I asked once more, when did your parents uh, learn that you had uh, got his phone number? I like held it close and I like double checked to like make sure. And I 
think I even like showed my parents and stuff. And I think in their minds, they were just like, holy shit, like our kid is doing the damn thing. Okay, so maybe school didn't work out for him, but like maybe he's meant for something. Maybe he's gonna do something. Maybe Josh can be a mentor. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this information is very important, not just for the main reasons that you're probably thinking, but also because it seems that the information of Johnny being with his parents when he got Joshua's phone number wasn't something which he had been extremely public about. In fact, I could not find any public statements from Joshua admitting to what he just admitted to Swoop before any of this. And it goes back to what I was speaking about earlier, of where he was clearly in a comfortable environment. In fact, he was bragging about this interview on social media for a very long time, clearly thinking that what he did in that interview was destroy somebody else's career, when in fact, he had done the absolute opposite. So him being comfortable allows him to think he can get away with saying absolutely any mistruth or taking things out of context possible. And this is exactly what happened here. Because it was clear that yes, his parents were then when he got this phone number and they approved of this. And why was that? Because it goes back to what I was speaking about earlier. Johnny was an aspiring influencer. He wanted to be famous on the platform and his parents approved of this. This was my ticket to success, my ticket to happiness. No one could take it away from me. And according to Swoop's own research in her video, it seemed that the parents kind of viewed this entire thing as a bit of a networking thing. They crossed country to go and see Colleen Ballinger live so their aspiring son who wanted to be an influencer could meet the right people to get into the industry. In Johnny's own words, his parents have been supportive of all of this, including him receiving Joshua David Evans' phone number. And given what we know now about Joshua receiving messages of Johnny being a sad, lost kid, uh, Johnny's YouTube ambitions, and Johnny's parents being supportive of him receiving mentorship, this story looks a whole lot different to me now. And yes, my friends, I do still think that it was inappropriate to hand their phone numbers out, but in the grand scheme of things of everything that has happened in this situation, I feel like this piece of information has been misrepresented as something else. And then we need to flip back to Trent Ballinger, because as we have seen in all of the tweets, Trent as well has been accused of the things that Colleen and Joshua were accused of. But in this interview with Swoop, it seems that he actually retracts that information and, and says the complete opposite. Trent Ballinger. The reason I've personally known that Trent Ballinger has been an issue for so long is because I was by him and honestly, it took Oliver's story to kind of wake me up from that situation as well. This was further backed up by a tweet Johnny made on June 17th when he explicitly calls himself a victim of Trent's. Now, here's him discussing Trent Ballinger on July 9th within the six hour train ride we went on. With Trent, I feel like our conversations were inappropriate in the sense that he was talking to an underage child but I don't personally feel like Trent really crossed any boundaries with me. And followed that by saying this. With Trent, I had a weird dynamic. With Corey, I didn't like him. I'm not sure if he liked me, but I wouldn't consider myself as a victim by either of those people. So as you can see, it's very confusing to what is actually going on here. It seems that these very serious criminal accusations that are being thrown around left, right, and center are being thrown around very carelessly. It seems to me that Johnny Silvestri genuinely doesn't care about the things that he is saying and the sheer gravity that these accusations have. I understand that these videos I make are in a way risky. I'm speaking about very sensitive things, very serious things, even when it comes to James Charles and you have to make sure you are getting the facts right. It's the main reason, as I keep saying, that I am covering this part of the story because so many facts have been skewed by Johnny Silvestri's careless actions. So number one, Johnny has clearly misrepresented the phone story and also left out key parts of the context to do with his parents actually being there in the story and being approving of things. But number two, he has also just called somebody something and then 
then the next day seemingly said the exact different thing. He has changed his mind on one of the most serious possible accusations. But of course, I understand what a lot of you will be thinking. Okay, if his parents were there, why does that matter? Maybe they just thought it was an innocent thing, but it turned out to not be an innocent thing. Because that is a, a definitive possibility that could happen in this situation. And the way we would find this out is by Johnny providing evidence. But as we've seen, when he's provided evidence in the past, the DMs have been doctored, and that will immediately make us more suspicious about everything else that he provides in the future. But I hear what you're saying, well, what if there are DMs? Are you now just going to ignore them at the sake of your own, like, uh, rhetoric or, or bias? No, I, I'm not actually doing that, because the problem is, is we're all still open for evidence and screenshots and all that good stuff. But, but, but Johnny isn't. It seems that every single time Swoop asked for screenshots of his conversations between him and Joshua over the text message in the phone number that has been so scrutinized in this entire story, Johnny basically refused to send the text every single time. I asked Johnny this. Do you still have, I'm just yeah. curious, do you still have uh, your text conversations with Josh? that I can check because my old MacBook Pro revived itself and I have to move quick and in small segments. Uh. So I really, really wanted to get the choline information, the meat and potatoes. So aside from a few edits for pacing, that was Johnny's complete answer to me asking him if I could see his text messages with Joshua David Evans, which I found interesting. Afterwards, I messaged Johnny asking if he had a specific text message from Joshua, uh, which he sent to me pretty quickly. And it's like, well, how could that be if he hadn't looked to see if he had text messages from Josh on his old computer? 10 days later, I had a phone call with Johnny and then confirmed this in text. I said, let me know if you're able to grab any text messages and he responded so far no luck but if i get my hands on any they'll go straight your way i mean this looks like he lied to me right on that phone call and in text we know that he has at the very least some text messages between him and josh he should know that we know that because he sent it to us previously i just found the text message where he asked me to run the account and gave me the account information which he tried to gloss over and pretend didn't happen but i have the proof now now to me personally i feel like it's very clear to what is going on here information is clearly being withheld. Information which I personally believe, based on all the lies that Swoop went through in her four hour video, is information which is available to Johnny Silvestri at this very moment of time. Because ladies and gentlemen, in this little segment, I'm not covering every single thing that Swoop speaks about in her video. Please, I implore you to, after this video, go and watch Swoop's entire video, or you know, at least watch it over time, because I understand these are very, very long videos. But please go watch it and look at the amount of lies and mistruths and taking things out of context that Johnny does in every single opportunity and ask yourself why would somebody who is so happy to accuse somebody 40 plus times until he is confronted on these accusations then he randomly mysteriously stops speaking about them because he was confronted why would he do any of this surely if he was so confident he could just happily provide these screenshots well maybe it's because these messages are actually not as bad as he has presented over the last few months and in fact maybe these messages just completely invalidate his entire story. And Swoop seemingly had the same opinions as me here, and it caused her and her team to go into absolute CSI mode. They went through the screenshots that they had, the things that Johnny had provided in the past, and they started analyzing every little thing that he actually had provided to work out the truth. And this is where they made a groundbreaking discovery. And also, if you're wondering why I'm sweaty right now, it's because it's randomly had a heat wave. The summer, the August and July, it ended, and now it's September, and I am sweating my nuts off. But I, I, I thought I would just give you guys that information before we get into the groundbreaking information. Don't say I don't give you all the facts on this channel. You're getting all of them here. I had run Twitter accounts for him that he encouraged, and he asked me to run for him. I just found the text message where he asked me to run the account 
account. So when I asked Johnny if he could send me the text messages between him and Josh about the Sarah Ridiculous account, he sent me a screenshot of his old computer with iMessages open in the background and a shot of their text exchange about Sarah D. But then my team and I noticed that the open text window he's showing has an iPhone file name at the top, indicating that this was a screenshot that was taken with his phone, which then made us think he has access to his old messages with Josh on his phone, took a screenshot of it, put it on his old computer, and then took a photo of it all together to make it look like he can only access it on his old computer, not his phone. Then we looked even closer. The iMessage window that is open behind it, that has the exact same screenshot of the Sarah D conversation in his messages with a larger blue bubble under it, meaning Johnny has sent this same screenshot of his messages with Josh to someone else. I don't know who, doesn't matter. But I still couldn't shake the suspicion that he's lying about having easy access to all of his old messages. So I looked even closer. Okay, so stay with me, okay? Detective Swoop, okay, we're doing this. So when you zoom in on the screenshot he sent, you can see this shape. It's a dark silhouette of a tree on a mountain. How do I know this? Because it's the default Mac El Capitan operating system desktop image. Yes, I'm a thorough bitch. And I remember when I saw this before in Johnny's post of the Trisha Paytas nude pics that he made on Twitter. When you zoom in, you can see that identical tree shape in the desktop background. And the iMessages bar has the same green half gradient at the top. I believe these to be the messages displayed on that same old computer. Now, here's where things get really up. John told me that he had sent a private apology video to Ella apologizing for when he and Colleen were bullying Ella behind her back. I asked to verify it and he sent me two clips. The first was him filming a computer that had the old messages pulled up where he's scrolling through the messages and giving commentary to Ella about those messages. This was odd because in the video the computer is clearly different. It looks to be like an iMac or at least an Apple display and you can see the background is different. That's a sandy beach scene with sand at the bottom and clear blue water at the top. And the iMessages window is in dark mode, not the white iMessages window from his previous screenshots, which means, in my opinion, Johnny Silvestri not only has access to his old text messages on his old computer, he also has instant access on his newer computer, which he's never claimed gives him any trouble. Furthermore, this would also mean that Johnny Silvestri would also likely have access to his old messages on his phone because it's Apple, just log in. A perfect example of this can be seen in Johnny's Ella story. In those screenshots that he tweeted, those were from his newer computer. They have the same sandy beach scene that matches his video that he allegedly sent Ella privately. These tweets were not from his old computer. Now to me personally, Johnny at this point of time has been given every single opportunity to provide the critical information that we all require. To understand what has truly transpired in this situation, we need to see every single possible screenshot. And I know that might sound a little bit sensitive, but when you're going to make 40 plus accusations, I think you have the right to at least publish some of the information that you claim to have. Yet it seems that in every single opportunity where you have been kindly listened to by everybody, the exact opposite of a response has happened. It has just been pure silence and nothing but lies. And the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, this isn't even the most significant part of Swoop's video, but merely because of this, it's caused everybody to now see Johnny as somebody who is an opportunist, somebody who is just wanting to get more popular off these very serious allegations. But worst of all, it's caused the very real victims in this story to seem and feel pushed aside because of the things Johnny has been saying. He was talking to me about how emotional this was gonna be for him to make. And I was like, well, of course I'm gonna support you. I specifically remember telling him like, I'll watch it on my Twitch and I'll re-upload it to YouTube and I'll redirect everyone your way. Like, like everyone needs to hear you like yours is equally as important as mine. And I remember his response to that was, or even more important, was exactly the words he said, and it will always stand out to me. It just, everything he did was a slap in the face, and it was always something he could do better. Like, as recently as when you did your interview with him, like, he on social media was hinting it in a way that the Reddit 
on all these different forums were picking up on the fact that he was saying that while well, Swift wanted to talk to him for six hours. I was on Twitch one day and people were like, Adam, how long were you speaking to Swift for? And I was like, only 45 minutes or something like that. And people were like, whoa. And I was like, what do you mean? And they were like, is that all? And I was like, well, yeah, I got asked questions and I answered them and it was 45 minutes. And they were like, oh, well, Johnny's story is definitely bigger because jo Johnny is saying how he was on for six hours and Swift wants to do more. It was framed to us like we are the inferior people in this story because you wanted to speak to Johnny for so long. Now, obviously, this is just depressing. I, I, I hate that so many victims in this story feel like they have been pushed aside and almost like their story has been quashed in the name of somebody else. And, and I don't think this is how it should be. We're not like doing Star Wars power level comparisons here. There isn't a significant power level to another allegation compared to another allegation. And it should not work like that. But it seems based on everything that Adam said in Swoop's video and everything I've heard, pretty much Johnny has tried to center himself right in the limelight of everything, taking pretty much the center stage of everything in this entire story, which based on everything, based on the lies and the mistruths, that is just genuinely disgusting. And if there's anything more sad than the amount I am sweating right now, it's the fact that Johnny's lies in this entire story aren't even good. Like, we've seen the ones that I've presented so far, but, but Johnny lies about really weird stuff, even things that actually make him look worse. For example, he's lied about bullying Adam as a child. Johnny himself even partook in some of the bullying of underage fans, including Adam, something Johnny actually admitted to me. I remember it was around 2013, starting to see this Adam kid pop up. So he was getting this access to Colleen Ballinger and all of us online by going under his parents' nose. We, as a 15, 16 year old, I didn't want to be talking to a nine or 10 year old. So we just kind of picked on him for being so young. And I say bully because I, hand on my heart, I, I in, was involved in mean stuff. But that admission was short lived because about two or so minutes later, he then flipped and said that he didn't partake in bullying Adam. But when it comes to Adam, Personally, I don't really think I partook. Even when me and him spoke on the phone for the first time last month, he even said he really didn't feel like I was invested in the bullying. So yes, uh, um, this is really, really weird. I I don't know why he thought he would get away with saying, oh yeah, I bullied him, but at the same time also saying, oh no, I actually didn't bully him. It's, it's very confusing. And I feel like everybody that originally saw this was, was well, well, confused. And Adam was one of these people. And Adam actually called out this because I can't imagine how, how weird this seems to be. Obviously, Adam's been pushed aside in this story by Johnny, but this is just another level of confusing. Like, why would you make a lie which is so easily disproved? Johnny has said many, many, many times in, like, interviews, journalist things, that him and his friends would do these tiny chat calls and they would, like, quote-unquote, bully me by, like, not letting me join the chat room with like Colleen and stuff. If he wanted to be a part of the tiny chats, we never gave him the information for it. We'd be like, ew, a kid. And then we'd kick him out and be like, no. That's bull <laughs> Like that didn't happen. If we link up the dates, I wasn't a part of the fandom at that stage. He has said time and time again, he was a generation before me in the fandom. So I don't know why people aren't piecing two and two together. Like, it was completely different eras. And my thing with Johnny was completely separate to Tiny Chat. Him and his friend group were like the OG Colleen fans, right? And they would have these calls with Colleen. I never, ever, ever, from my recollection, of course I'm talking about myself as, what, like a 10 year old, was never a part of those. And Johnny has spoken about this multiple times being like, we would let him join the video chats and we would like kind of bully him by ostracizing him. And he would say that Colleen would bully him by like saying he was weird and not letting him into the video calls and stuff. And I'm like, these dates don't line up. And Johnny has said this so, so many times where he's like, we would bully Adam. And I take full accountability for that. And I say bully because I, hand on my heart, I, I in, was involved in mean stuff. I mean, I won't say I'm perfect, I'm not. It's like he's taking accountability for things that he's making up. Especially whenever my opinion of Johnny and the fandom was always that Johnny was 
the mean girl. Johnny was the one who wanted everyone to think that he was Colleen's best friend and stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, it just kind of feels like there is an absolute spider web of lies going on here. And honestly, connecting every single dot is very difficult at this moment of time. I spoke in private to Adam McIntyre telling him that I'm working on this video and he even said to me, I'm probably losing my mind doing this because I, I, I absolutely have. There is just so much bollocks, which I, I, I'm genuinely shocked by at this point. Like, I feel like this video has gone from some very serious things, the lawyer stuff, to this, which is just, I keep saying it, confusing. Why are there such silly lies in this situation which make Johnny look even worse, but at the same time, as I said earlier, sadly damage this entire story. Because if there's one liar in this story, it will affect things in a negative way. It will cause people to be like, oh, well, I'm going to doubt this person now who's speaking up and this person because that person lied. And when it's somebody like Johnny, who has pushed victims aside in this story, has made him seem like the, the limelight, the centerpiece of everything. You know, we have the six hour interview with Swoop. The guy is the most important one, apparently. When that that person is a liar, it only benefits Colleen Ballinger. And I've seen a lot of people theorizing over Johnny's involvement in this situation, basically saying, well, let's throw back to 2023, earlier this year, of where he admitted he went to a show where he tried to rekindle his friendship with Colleen. He was clearly still a fan of her earlier this year, and is this him doing his thing to protect Colleen, to make the story seem a little bit more invalid in general, not just with him, but with everybody? Now, personally, I feel like that is a tinfoil hat theory. It would be rather entertaining and absolutely mental, but personally, I don't think that's the case here. In fact, I feel like this theory is just being used to give some form of logical explanation to how this guy got away with everything in this story, because it is absolutely wild that he did. But to be honest with you, I think it's just a case of this person was a very good manipulator. Look at the fact of whenever he was questioned about his story, he seemingly said, if you don't believe me, then you don't believe everybody else. I don't care if you tell your story, just don't discredit mine. Even if they leave the article still believing me, they might think to themselves, well, if Johnny is embellishing this stuff about Josh, what else could he potentially be embellishing? What might Adam be embellishing? He's basically saying here, if you don't believe me, then you don't believe Adam and you don't believe victims. That, that's basically what is happening here, which is just so unbelievably despicable towards the real victims in this story. And again, it makes me think that I can understand more why people would buy into the theory of, is this Colleen Ballinger pulling the strings and all that? Obviously, I, for, for what I... I I, I don't think she's smart enough to do that. I don't think I'm smart enough or you're smart enough to do that. That's like some Game of Thrones sh I don't think that's possible. But it would be kind of impressive in a really messed up way. It would be like Emperor Palpatine taking over the Republic, but in this case, it's the YouTube community. And rather than the Dark Lord of the Sith returning, it would be Colleen Ballinger returning. But no... None of that is true. I think all this is, is Johnny Silvestri wanted attention. He doesn't care about victims. But as I said earlier, he is also protecting himself, which we will go into. But should we be shocked by any of this with statements like this? He actively chose to remain in this relationship. He had so many outs. He didn't propose for like nine years. Why did you enter a marriage that was so toxic if you knew it was so bad? You must have wanted something out of it. And it bit you in the ass he f***ed around and found out and now he's just upset about it <laughs> this is how johnny silvestri described a man in an abusive relationship he blamed the person saying he wanted something and that's why he stayed this is how johnny views victims so no i don't think there's some big colleen theory here i just think this is honestly not a very good person. But ladies and gentlemen, it's time to move away from him using this story to get him in the limelight and move into the third theory that I've been speaking about briefly throughout this. To protect himself. 
what do I actually mean by this? How would this story actually benefit Johnny in any way, shape, or form? And by story for context, I mean the story of accusing Colleen Ballinger's ex-husband of the things that Johnny accused him of. Why would that benefit him? Well, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to another person in this story known as Tim Colony, who is another former Colleen fan, but most importantly, it is Johnny Silvestri's best friend. And ladies and gentlemen, to cut a long story short, if you want the full story, obviously go watch Swoop's video, but to cut a very long story short, pretty much Tim has recently been accused of being a and speaking inappropriately with Colleen Ballinger's young fans in group chats and video calls. And pretty much the belief is, is that Johnny, his best friend, not only enabled this behavior by getting Tim in contact with Johnny's own fans, because as I mentioned earlier, Johnny Silvestri had his own subsection of a fan base in Colleen Ballinger's fan base. This is something that happens throughout a lot of fandoms. For example, in Star Wars, there are fan bases of certain projects who don't speak about other projects that's just something that happens and it seems that in the ballinger fan base there was a subsection of fans who loved johnny silvestri and the accusation is now that johnny got his friend tim Connolly allegedly in contact with these people via live streams via video calls and group chats and it allowed tim to act inappropriately with these fans being drunk in calls saying strange and weird things and just in general being very very inappropriate with young fans. Of course, these are just allegations, but based on everything, there are a lot of tweets about these things. There are a lot of videos and, and, and photos of these two in group calls with young fans. To me personally, it does seem very suspicious. And now what I want to remind you of is the fact that all of Johnny's allegations about Joshua stem back to around the era of 2013 to 2015. These allegations about Tim Colony and Johnny Silvestri enabling his behavior goes back to 2020, only three years ago. What makes all of this even more disturbing to me is that we also found a series of tweets where Johnny openly admits to being drunk while engaging with one of his underage fans himself when the fan was 15 or 16 years old at the time. The same fan that Johnny has been talking to and in group chats with since they were 13 years old and they're still in private group chats with him right now. And even if the anonymous tip we received was inaccurate in any way, I need to point out that the timestamp on that photo I just showed of Johnny being informed that Tim was falling asleep drunk with minors in video calls that Johnny was also allegedly on is April 12th, 2020. Now my friends, this is where we start to get into the whole protecting self thing because I want to refer back to a tweet I showed you at the beginning of the segment where Johnny aired his support for Colleen Ballinger all the way back in 2020. He saw the accusations, he knew what was going on, and he definitely knew what was going on behind the scenes. The things that me or you may not have seen, there may be things that we don't know about at this point of time, Johnny Silvestri definitely knew about those things because he was there. He was one of the biggest players in this community. As we've seen from the screenshots, the videos, he was involved and embedded with the young fans of this community and he definitely knew what was going on, yet he chose to air his support for Colleen Ballinger even when he was around the ages of 23 slash 24. And personally, what I believe is that in 2020, Johnny was very worried. I think he saw these allegations against Colleen and knew for a fact that he had helped his friend get in contact with young fans of Colleen and do inappropriate things. The type of things that Colleen had been accused of, if not even worse. These allegations are very, very serious and of course they are mainly aimed at Tim Colony, but it doesn't change the fact that he enabled Tim. He was in these calls drunk. There are tweets still out there right now of fans referring to seeing Johnny drunk. It's very, very weird and it is exactly what Johnny said that Joshua did to him. Remember this tweet earlier? Yeah, it's not particularly age 
aging too well right now. If we take the logic of that tweet and apply it to the actions of not just Tim Colony, but just Joshua Silver, sorry, Johnny Silvestri, there's too many J's in this story, of Johnny Silvestri, then the picture starts to get even more disturbing. Because by his logic, he has done everything that Joshua has done, but even worse, and also has enabled other people's genuine terrible behavior, which he himself has described as the same accusations that Colleen has faced. As you can see in these tweets here, he called out his former best friend, calling him all the possible things that you can imagine. So I think in 2020, because of all of this, Johnny made a move to to pretty much go with the public opinion, because when Colleen Ballinger responded to these accusations, the public opinion was in her favour. So Johnny protected himself by going with the public, because if he went against Colleen, which he probably should have, he would then get exposed by the fans that are still on Colleen's side, because they would see him criticising Colleen and think, hey, didn't you do the exact same thing, if not worse? And you may think, well, what about 2023? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think that Johnny has applied the exact same logic in this part of the story, because in 2020, he went with the main public opinion, and in 2023, he changed his opinion, and then went with the current public opinion, which was now against Colleen. And by doing that, he called out Colleen, but also shaped himself to seem like a victim, and he elaborately planted the story of, if you don't believe me, you don't believe people like Adam McIntyre. Well, if Johnny is embellishing this stuff, about Josh, what else could he potentially be embellishing? What might Adam be embellishing? And because of this, you could no longer question his story. If you even dared to say, hey, some things aren't adding up here. Hey, oh, why have you doctored some evidence? Hey, why are you just hiding things and, and, and not telling the truth? If you said that, you were speaking against victims. He had protected himself by actually framing himself to be the main victim in this story. But even if you think this protecting himself theory isn't actually true here, and it may not be, but based on all the things and all of the dark things that Swoop has dug up in her video, you could also just apply the fact that, yes, maybe he was just using these situations to his own benefit. For example, in 2020, when he went with the public opinion, that would have benefited him socially. He could remain friends still with his million subscriber YouTuber friend, and he could continue lapping up the benefits of that. But in 2023, when the financial benefit if it was to actually go against that person, he would then do that, because if he didn't, he would take a financial hit. So yes, there are either two things that we can go with here, the protecting himself thing, or the financial aspect. Personally, I think it's probably a mix of both. Which obviously, ladies and gentlemen, is absolutely grim, but that's pretty much the same for every single element to this story that we've gone through today. It seems that as you further go down this rabbit hole, there is just another bad thing, another bad thing, and yet again, another absolutely horrible thing. This whole entire story is just so dark and depressing, and honestly quite creepy. I've never actually seen a community like this, which is just so unbelievably and surprisingly terrible. Usually, when you see a YouTuber like Colleen Ballinger and you don't really know much about them, you just think, oh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a little YouTuber that does fun things for kids, and then you really look into it and it gets worse and worse and worse, and then there are fans like Johnny Silvestri who are also doing whatever it, it's... It, it's just depressing. And I think after three hours, I'm just kind of starting to lose my mind. This is like the fifth recording I've done on this video, and I am... I'm losing it. But I understand what a few people will be saying. Well, where does this actually all tie into Colleen? Because yes, I just mentioned her, but seemingly this part of the story isn't exactly directly tied to her. Yes, Johnny is a part of her community, but it's not its not Colleen doing Johnny's actions for him. And yeah, you're not actually wrong, that is absolutely true, but to actually work out how this ties to Colleen, we need to go and look at her ex-husband, which 
This isn't a statement I ever thought we'd do. I'm not doing divorce analysis on this channel, but there is some key information to hear to why Joshua Evans became such a target in this situation. Well, basically, over the research I've done for these three videos, I've discovered that actually for, for years now, this guy has seemingly had a very bad reputation in Colleen Ballinger's fan base. Not just when Colleen was in the center spot of controversy, but also when people liked Colleen, people thought badly of this person. When you look at the advanced Twitter search and you search this guy's name before everything that happened in this situation, there are a lot of terrible things said about Joshua Evans. And my friends, the reason for that is Colleen Ballinger. And I'm not just saying that to kind of tie things back into her on a complete loose end. No, this is a this is a genuine thing. We have to throw back to video number one. Yeah, like nine hours ago. In that video, I went over a lot of the DMs in the Weenies group chat where Colleen Ballinger spoke to her very young fans. And while she said some absolutely inappropriate things to her fans like this and this, there were also some things, well, a lot of things mentioned about Colleen's divorce. Because yes, in Colleen's spare time, she absolutely loved to have a little chitter chat with her 14 year old fan about how her divorce is going. These are really normal people that we're dealing with. And in these DMs, she pretty much started to build a reputation of her ex-husband, saying some of the worst possible things that you can say to a child. And even if you only say, in, in our perspective, some slightly bad things, you know, we've all gone through breakups, we've all said some things which we may not actually believe, but you know, you're crying, Yeah, you, that's how it is, you, you're trying to grieve, but... When I'm personally trying to grieve, I'm not going over to my 14-year-old niece and, and telling her how much of a dickhead my ex is. I'm not doing that because they'll probably think what I'm saying is, is 50 times worse because kids are impressionable, you know? They, they hear an adult saying certain things to them and for some reason that just makes their mind go really quick and they start to take every word you say as, as, as even worse and is even deeper. Whereas as adults, we know when we go through breakups, we're just, you know, we're just grieving pretty much to get over what we're going through. And what Colleen was saying in these DMs, whether they're true or not, they were very irresponsible things to not just say to children, Children, but to say to super fans, because as we have seen with people like Johnny Silvestri, these people will do absolutely anything to get any form of attention, especially when they are young super fans. When somebody is a fan of somebody, they want to do absolutely everything they can to get closer to that person, to become friendlier with that person, so they could say that that person, i.e., Colleen Ballinger, is her bestie. And because of that, because Colleen was sharing this confidential information with her followers, building this parasocial relationship, the negative reputation of Joshua Evans progressively got worse and worse and worse. And that ties in to Johnny Silvestri because Joshua at that point was an easy target. So whatever Johnny said, people would eat it up because of what Colleen has already said. Yes, this part of the story is mainly to do with Johnny Johnny Silvestri, but honestly, it wasn't really started by Johnny. The negative reputation of Colleen's ex-husband was started by Colleen. And with this entire community, with all of the negative things that we've looked back, it always does actually somewhat seem to tie back to Colleen. Now, of course, the adults in the situation should take responsibility. I, I, I don't deny that whatsoever, whether it's Cody Tyler or Johnny Silvestri or Corey DeSoto, any of these people, they should take responsibility for their own actions. But Colleen should take responsibility for normalizing the behavior in her community because with the things that was happening with people like Tim Colony and also Johnny Silvestri and everybody else, the reason that that wasn't called out for so long was because Colleen seemingly normalized this behavior in the community. It was seen as, as, as a normal thing for people to get drunk on live calls when they're adults speaking to children. It was apparently a, a normal thing. Colleen Ballinger basically making it out to to be normal that she sent underwear to a child. That normalizes this behavior and only allows these people to get away with their creepy, creepy actions. And this entire community is just so, as I said about five minutes ago, just depressing and utterly terrible. And from an outside view, you really wouldn't think so. But when you look into this entire situation, it progressively becomes more and more shocking. I understand if you were to look at my free videos, you 
would think to yourself, oh, this guy's leeching the topic, and maybe, maybe I am, like, going overboard on some things here and there, maybe I am speaking about things for a bit too longer than I should, but honestly, I, I don't think for the most part I am. I actually think that this situation is one of the biggest things that has happened on YouTube in, for, for, for years, because this whole thing has been covered up for five plus years, going back to 2014 and 15. I was in university back then. This whole thing has been going on for years, and I feel like more and more stuff is progressively going to come out because of how much terrible stuff was normalized in this community. As I said, I've not covered every single detail of this Johnny Silvestri story, but from what I have said, you can just see from this one bit alone, it's absolutely terrible. But then go and speak to every, well, listen to every other victim in this story, and it only gets a million times worse, and that is because pretty much for years, this community was, was not really a community, but basically a cult. The cult of Colleen. But of course, I'm not just going to blame Colleen here. Of course, the main person in this chapter of the video that is at fault, at wrong, is Johnny Silvestri. And what I find crazy about Johnny in particular is just how... Uh, how he thought he was going to get away with some of the things that he was saying. It only took one internet commentator to, 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 to notice something not really adding up. For example, Johnny was one of the main people to come out and be like, Oh, uh, Colleen, you were sending photos of Trisha to people. You know, you were taking her explicit photos and sending them to me and Adam McIntyre, which of course is, is, is a bad thing, but... Johnny himself was also sending around Trisha's photos, and it's not like this uh, This information that I'm telling you now came from a, a, a leaked DM, you know, a, a whistleblower came out or something like that. No, this information came from Johnny himself. He said it to swoop. If I'd find a photo, I'd follow Trisha, so if she posts something publicly, or sometimes I would literally just go to Google and type in, like, Trisha Paytas nude, but... I never did it to body shame Trish. I will say on one account, there was something that was nasty of me that I said. In regards to her body, I would go the extra length, find my own picture to send back, and I'd be like, hey girl, you know, like, posted a new Instagram, how do I look? And then she'd be like, oh my god, you're dumb, but you looked hot. Just little things like that. Now, honestly, it, it really just seems that this guy is pretty much every single thing that he has criticized Colleen for. Like, look at the back at the tweet that I mentioned earlier. Everything that's said in that tweet, he is guilty of. Everything when it comes to throwing around photos of Trisha Paytas, he is guilty of. Now, maybe he did not, well, he did as not, as far as I know, send those photos to Adam and it was just sending them to Colleen. But ultimately, it's still an incredibly immoral thing. The whole point comes from shaming Trisha, but also just downloading some someone's pics and sending them around is just an absolutely disgusting thing to do. But again, it does stem back to Colleen. She normalized this behavior, she enabled this behavior, and of course Johnny Silvestri was an adult and he should take equal responsibility, but the reason he was doing this was to get the attention of Colleen. Find my own picture to send back and I'd be like, hey girl, you know, like, Posted a new Instagram, how do I look? And then she'd be like, oh my god, you're dumb, but you looked hot. He knew she loved to send around these photos. He knew that it would get her attention, get a laugh, and possibly make uh, him closer. And... That's what he did, and it's just absolutely insane to me. So yeah, ultimately, this entire chapter comes down to one, wanting to get popularity, two, protecting himself over previous situations that he probably remembered were going to bite him in the ass, but three, the community cultivated by Colleen Ballinger. Everything in this story always stems back to this person and the adults in the situation that normalized all of this horrific behavior. And ladies and gentlemen, that pretty much does cover this part of the chapter, but of course, since then, that was around uh, three weeks ago at the time of recording this video, there have been some updates. Johnny has come out and responded in a good old fashioned note sap tweet thing. Like, fellas, if you're going to make public statements, could you just put on the, the camera? It, it makes ev ev everything so much easier, and at least speaking to a camera seems actually or authentic. Now, I'm actually going to go through this response. I'm, I'm going to look at it a little bit. I've read it. It's it's nothing groundbreaking. It doesn't disprove anything. It's pretty hard to actually disprove anything in this story because, you know, we've proved the hypocrisy. Swoop went through everything and showed all the things that Johnny was calling other people. He was doing the exact same thing. I don't know how you're going to disprove this stuff. Apparently, this is weaponizing trauma, but I mean... 
again, I don't know Joshua Evans. I don't know if he's a bad guy or a good guy. But what I can see is the allegations facing him all seems to stem from hypocrisy. I, I don't think giving out your phone number was a wise thing to do. I think it was something that you shouldn't have done. But I don't think it constitutes the allegations that jo Johnny has made. Now, maybe there is more information for all we know. Maybe. But if there was, why has not that, that not been put out there? Swoop has given this guy a billion opportunities but in those opportunities he's refused to send things based on lies and he's also doctored evidence so what does he expect anybody in this situation to take from this other than he is an opportunist and a liar honestly the whole situation does just seem like a complete utter mess at this point i'm laughing because I mean, for one, I'm starting to lose my mind, as I said. I I don't know how much longer we are going to be going on for, but yeah, the whole thing is an absolute mess. And I think the, the, the final part of this entire story, which I don't think that has actually been spoken about that much, is the legal matters in this whole story. Because obviously, there have been so many wild allegations thrown around with Johnny, with Joshua, with Colleen, with Trent Ballinger. A lot of criminal allegations. And with criminal allegations on YouTube, there is something mysterious where people admit to doing absolutely heinous crimes and for some reason they never actually end up in jail and as we've seen Colleen does have some of the best lawyers in the business and I think it's time to delve in to the legal ramifications of everything that's happening in this scenario. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to the legal system on YouTube, things are a little bit scary. Now, personally, whenever I actually see somebody be affected by the legal system when it comes to YouTubers, um, it's never actually usually for the good things. The only time I ever see anybody actually get uh, some form of legal repercussions is when they're being sued for, you know, giving their opinions, saying some things that may or may not have happened. Personally, uh, when it comes to my business of legalities, I have been threatened with multiple defamation lawsuits. But when it comes to actually people getting real, actual justice and not silencing people, there never really seems to be any actual, well, justice. Innocent until proven guilty, of course, is the main phrase that we will use when it comes to the legal systems. And when it comes to Colleen Ballinger, Colleen technically right now is innocent until proven guilty. There hasn't been a criminal conviction, as far as we know, made against Colleen. And in the eyes of the law, Colleen has not actually done anything at all. In comparison to me and you, Colleen is apparently on the exact same level because there have been no criminal convictions in a US court. But ladies and gentlemen, I love speaking about the legal system. I love speaking about possible legal ramifications. And it does actually seem that despite everything that I'm saying right now, there is a genuine possibility that Colleen Ballinger right now could actually face future legal repercussions for things that have come out in this situation. But not just that. Colleen herself seemingly has actually kind of self-reported. She actually has kind of made herself vulnerable to a lawsuit. And with that, I introduce to you Legal Bites, which is a YouTube channel which is ran by an attorney called, I I, I believe, um, a light. I'm, I'm not actually too sure on how to pronounce your name. I'm I'm sorry if that sounds really bad. It, it, I will just refer to you as Legal Bites. And I firstly want to say, please could you go and check out Legal Bites' channel because we will be using a lot of information from them, or pretty much all of the information that they have given in their video. But Legal Bites is an attorney that is licensed to practice in California. And basically, she runs this education based YouTube channel where she goes over a lot of popular topics and looks at it from a a legal aspect. And in today's case, Colleen Ballinger is being focused on in a free part series that Legal Bites has uploaded in the last month. And personally, I think this is quite important to look at, mainly because I can come on here and say, this is a terrible thing, this is a terrible thing, but when it comes to actually getting justice, I think actually getting the legal definitions of, is this legally a wrong thing, is a very important thing. So I think we should firstly look into what could Colleen actually be penalized for in the eyes of the law when it comes to this situation. And in this first part, which I very much recommend you go and watch after this video because we will only be covering a small part from it, they basically open up the video saying that Colleen could be penalized with this. So the closest thing that I can see that could pin Colleen under California law would be California Penal Code Section 288.2. This law criminalizes the act of sending explicit material to minors. 
But keep in mind that there are a number of elements that have to be met in order for this law to apply to this situation. And yes, of course, this is to do with Colleen Ballinger sending explicit photos of Trisha Paytas to minors. Obviously, we all agree that that's an absolutely horrible thing and probably is the, the worst part of this story because seemingly it is something which a lot of people believe to be a criminal action. But obviously, I'm just a YouTube commentator, fellas. I come on here, I try to give you guys the facts, Give my give my little opinion and stuff like that whilst I'm holding my gay little microphone. But I'm I'm not a lawyer. I don't know the specifics of the law, and I have been wondering: is this part of the story something which could get her in jail? But then I look at somebody that I mentioned earlier, James Charles, who admitting to you know Snapchatting minors, and and he didn't go to jail, and it was a very confusing moment. And you think to yourself: is it a power thing, a money thing? Well, legal pites, pites, <laughs> bites, actually, uh, um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought, goes over it, they go over Maybe it. Maybe they should change their channel name to Legal Pints. You can only drink pints at the age of 18, and if you're in America, it's 21. And if you're drinking pints before that age, we will find out. So yeah, um, don't know what that was. Yeah, Legal Bites basically goes over the groundworks to what would actually constitute breaking the law in the context of Colleen sending these photos of Trisha to Adam. And uh, yeah, let's take a look at what Legal Bites has to say. This is what the prosecution would have to show in order to give the defendant prison time for something like this. First, the defendant has to know or be in a position to know that the person that they are talking to or communicating with is in fact a minor. Second, the defendant has to send what's called harmful matter, like explicit images, to the minor and sending them by text messages qualifies. Third, the defendant has to have the intent of arousing, appealing to, or gratifying certain desires in the minor in the act of sending it. And finally, the defendant has to have sent that material to the minor with the intent of engaging in some kind of mature act with that minor. All elements have to be met in order for the defendant to be held criminally liable under that statute. And personally, I don't think that we get there, especially because of that fourth element. That's because it does appear that Colleen sent those images to those minors, not necessarily because she wanted to do certain things with these minors, but because she wanted to be inappropriately funny. That's the way it appears anyway, based on what I've seen. Now I understand a lot of people will be disappointed to see that yes, this doesn't all come under the points technically uh, in most people's opinion of the law. And, and I don't understand that will be disappointing because most people will think, well, you know, there shouldn't have to be some groundwork here. It should be pretty simple. Have you sent an explicit photo to a minor? Yes? Well, well, congratulations, son. You're going, going to jail. jail. But obviously, in this case, the law says differently. And I think in this part with the Colleen situation, I, I, I think it will mainly come down to the argument of public opinion. Do you personally think that what Colleen did was bad? And and if so, I guess the, the only action you can really do is to unsubscribe and not really consume her content anymore. And to be honest with you, that's the case with most of these situations, which I've noticed over the years of covering, you know, predatory actions and, and weird stuff going on on the internet. When it comes to actually getting any form of justice for victims, Victims, there's never really any I, and I don't know why but I, I guess it's because when it comes to social media, it's so international and it, it's so hard to prove certain things over the internet. And that maybe that will change with time and maybe we can start up a conversation here about that because it does just seem so many people get away with so much. And when you look at the Killing community, which we've gone throughout this entire video, it is just so grim and disgusting. And it brings up the question of how have so many people gotten away with their actions? But ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't mean that all of the legal repercussions possibly ends there because that's when we move into the argument of civil liability and once again i should just say could you please subscribe to legal bites because once again i am just a mere commentary youtuber that doesn't exactly know the law from back to front legal bites is a practicing attorney and please go watch their videos i'm only going to try and play small amounts of clips that i can just to explain everything to you but yes Civil liability. So civil liability refers to a situation where it's not the state that is bringing a case against a defendant, but it's a private party who is bringing a case because they've been personally harmed by the defendant. And usually they request damages as a result. And based on my research, I've found a number of situations where Colleen could face some civil liability. And to be clear, I'm talking about cases that are strong enough that they probably would proceed at least into the discovery phase, which is the phase where both parties 
parties are exchanging information, demanding information, evidence from one another. It's the stage where the litigation fees instantly jump way up and the other side gets access to information that otherwise would generally remain very private. Depending on the case and the allegations involved, I'm talking things like medical records, tax filings, communications between family members, and other things that are normally considered very private. This is also where information can get leaked to the public because now more people simply have access to it, especially if there's no protective order in place. Now, to be honest with you fellas, this pretty much just seems to be everything that you, me, your grandma, and your granddad have been doing over the last few months when it comes to this situation on the internet. People have been leaking information, DMs have been leaked, group chats have been leaked, live show clips have been reposted. So much has come out in this story, but obviously everything in this story is over social media. It is honestly just perceived as YouTube drama, so it's not a court case and it makes a lot of things become quite convoluted. And according to Legal Bites in her video, the type of civil case that could face Colleen Ballinger is the intentional infliction of a emotional distress. And this could come under a lot of the things that we've discussed throughout these three videos, the underwear story, the Miranda Sings live show story, the Trisha Paytas photo story, plenty of things out there could come under this argument. But to once again prove this case, it all needs to come under five specific things that Legal Bites in their video lists, which is number one, defendant committed an act. And yeah, we, we, we all know that the defendant has committed the acts that I did just describe. So number two is defendant's act is outrageous. Things that we would not usually tolerate as a society, you know, things that technically really aren't morally something which is is justifiable. For example, sending an explicit photo to a minor, sending underwear to a minor. These are traditionally things that we as a society would not consider a morally right thing to do. So I think it does come un uh, under number two. But then moving on to number three is defendant acted intentionally in brackets purposely or recklessly and I mean, based on everything that we've seen, it, it very much was also that. So number four is plaintiff suffered severe emotional harm. And, and yeah, based on everything that we've seen in these stories, that absolutely is the case. And then number five is defendant caused plaintiff severe emotional distress, which once again is something that, in my opinion, absolutely is the case in this scenario, which means with these five points, I personally believe that Colleen Ballinger comes under all five of them. But what makes this even worse, ladies and gentlemen, is the self-report that I mentioned earlier, because Legal Bites actually picks something out in one of Colleen's own videos where she speaks about this whole situation in her ukulele video, and she describes the situation as, you know, something that she probably shouldn't have done, something which was weird, and Legal Bites said this. And as for these explicit communications with minors, here's where Colleen's ukulele video comes in to potentially bite her in the ass. See, in the video, she kind of makes a number of admissions about some of these allegations about the communications with minors. It's kind of like uh, when you go to like a family gathering, you know, and there's a weird aunt there who keeps coming up to you and going like, hey girl, what's the tea? And you're like, Ugh. Um, that was me, but in group chats with my fans, it was weird. I didn't really understand that maybe there should be some boundaries there. There were times in the DMs when I would overshare details of my life, which was really weird of me. Hey everybody, I found someone new to harass. She did some things that I do not like in her past. Have I made some jokes in poor taste? Yes. Have I made lots of dumb mistakes? Yes. Am I sad that there are some fans who feel betrayed? Yes. This indicates that she recognizes that there was a line and she crossed it. And a skilled trial lawyer could 100% drag her in front of a jury on cross-examination, pressing her about this recognition and when exactly that light bulb went off. So yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this is becoming a bit of a problem for Colleen Ballinger. If somebody wanted to, they absolutely could form this type of case against her, in my personal opinion, and based on this information in Legal Bites' video. I think it is quite hilarious 
this that she has self-reported here, considering that pretty much every single part of this story has been always a massive self-report, with basically any adult in this story. With Colleen, it's constant self-reports. With Johnny, it's constant self-reports. With everybody else, it's always self-reports. People that just stumble into these terrible situations because they just seemingly can't help themselves. But then it only gets worse in the second video in this series titled Colleen Ballinger's Massive Legal Mistakes Part 2, Using Fans as Free Labor. And yeah, this video is pretty much what it is described on the tin. It is a video where she goes through a lot of the accusations that Colleen has faced that she has basically been using her fans for free labor. Because during the whole situation, one of the main points that was made out by Adam McIntyre in his first video was that he did work for Colleen Ballinger. Now, obviously, this has been a very debated point. I stand with Adam. But the problem is, it doesn't come from actually what Adam said. It once again comes from what Colleen Ballinger said in her video in 2020. Because once again, Colleen Ballinger has self-reported and got herself in hot water. Colleen makes an admission in a video, specifically her 2020 apology video responding to Adam McIntyre's video. And how hiring my employees works is I usually do a little test run to see how it goes. If it goes well, then I hire them officially through my company and they are paid legally through the corporation. Here, she just admitted that she has a pattern of practice of trying out fans as employees before she legally pays them through her business as official employees. The words that just came out of her mouth indicate that she routinely makes fans work for free before she gives them paid work. That is not okay under California law. If you give someone tasks for your business with the intent that they actually fulfill those tasks, you are getting value for that and you have to pay for it. If you require some kind of mandatory training for someone before they officially start working for you, you have to pay them for that time that they are spending in that training. Now, there are some exceptions to this rule, such as unpaid internships, and under some kind of circumstances, I can see an argument being made with independent contractors who would be paid in kind of a different sort of way. But neither of those exceptions apply in these circumstances. For unpaid internships to be legal under California law, there are a bunch of requirements that have to be met. First of all, being tied to some kind of academic program that the intern is actually in. And that's just one requirement. And as it relates to independent contractors, California is arguably the hardest place to qualify a worker as an independent contractor due to what is called the ABC test. This is a three-part test that says that by default, any worker is an employee of the business unless three criteria are met. First, the worker has to be actually independent in the way that he or she does the work. In other words, the employer isn't asserting any kind of control over how they go about doing the work. Second, it has to be the case that the worker is doing work that is outside the employer's normal business. But here, posting to social media as Miranda sings is pretty damn central to Colleen's business. So if any of those three criteria are not met, that person is considered an employee, not an independent contractor. And in that case, a very large number of labor laws apply along with a lot of penalties and fees and all kinds of other restrictions. Now, firstly, I do find it hilarious the amount of times this woman is just, just so determined to get herself in even more trouble. You can't say to me, phrasing your milk in the topic, when it's just more and more every single day. And obviously, I'm not a legal expert. I didn't know that this was a problem years ago, but there are also some problems on the plaintiff side if they were to put a case against Colleen. And in this case, the plaintiff being Adam McIntyre. You see, that situation, those videos there, are now over three years old, and by the law, this means that Adam can no longer make a claim. But the reason that Legal Bites brings up this topic in the video is not just because she wants to, you know, highlight possible laws broken in the past, but also there is the fact that in this video, Colleen makes it out to sound like this practice that she did with Adam with hiring him for free as some sum of test trial. This is something that she has done more than once. And Legal Bites pretty much makes out that it wouldn't really be a surprise if Colleen carried on this practice after the story with Adam McIntyre, which if is the case, there could be a genuine possibility of another form of legal threat against Colleen Ballinger. Now, obviously, this part is just mere speculation, but again, based on what she said in the video, I would not be surprised if this 
this tactic used on Adam was also used on other individuals. But even here, ladies and gentlemen, the whole legal aspect of this thing doesn't end there because then we move into the whole conversation of charity fraud. Now, this obviously goes into a very sensitive area, but pretty much over the years, Colleen Ballinger has been somebody that has campaigned for multiple charities. She has earned a lot of money for charity by raising it in fundraisers and all that good stuff. But there has been a bit of an overarching shadow over this, you know, genuine nice behavior. People believe that Colleen Ballinger has not donated all of the amounts that she raised via other people's donations. Now, personally, I have looked into this and there are some rather fishy things that have happened in this part of the story. And people have actually been speaking about this for years now. It's not like this is just a thing of where, you know, oh, she's on her downfall. So we're going to bring up absolutely everything. This is something that has been spoken about in murmurs throughout Colleen's community for years and i i can understand why that there are some very fishy things going on there but personally as, as much as i say I, I i well i'm going to say i don't think colleen is that stupid you know obviously i'm not surprised by anything at this point but i personally don't believe that surely colleen ballinger would steal from charity i, I just don't think that that is something that could happen here but you never know i may get proven wrong in the future but pretty much in legal bites video she goes over the possibility of if there was charity fraud in this situation obviously colleen ballinger would face very very serious legal repercussions which i think also can result in actual jail time which moves us into the conversation of will Colleen face any jail time I think the pretty obvious answer is no now I understand that when it comes to the civil aspect of things there could be some penalties there but I don't think that does lead to any jail sentences I think that is mainly to do with financial repercussions people getting compensation but when it comes to actually breaking the law and going into the slammer I I don't think that's gonna happen and I think most of you probably also don't think that as I said previously sadly on YouTube there does seem to be a trend of people admitting to doing terrible things and just absolutely getting away with it red kiwis for example, admitted to some of the most terrible things possible, but he's still uploading Fortnite content. And you really just have to wonder, is there any justice when it comes to this platform? Honestly, I, I really don't think so. Because honestly, with everything that we've gone through today, I, I really don't actually believe that Colleen has got it that bad. And that might sound absolutely insane. You may say, Fraser, the entire internet is against her. Well, yes, but she still has some fans she still has some level of an audience and ladies and gentlemen this entire situation is just i will keep saying it for like a 50th time but insane i've never seen so much stuff boil up over a 10 year span which has seemingly been covered up and buried alive for years and i i think that the repercussions of losing subscribers really is probably one of the best things that could happen to colleen she's not really getting hit financially she's not getting any fines yes she won't be getting any more monetization but she's a millionaire she lives in a mansion and all of the other bad people in this story there they're not going to jail they're not getting any repercussions people just now call them a bellend pretty much and honestly in the grand scheme of things getting called a bellend after all of this that almost seems like a bit of a reward. So yeah, in conclusion to this legal aspect, firstly, thank you so much to Legal Bites for uploading these three wonderful videos, giving their insight on these stories. And I, I highly recommend after this, you go and watch these videos. But yeah, I, I don't think there will be any repercussions. And that's mainly because when it comes to justice on this platform, there absolutely really isn't any. I've covered these types of stories for years now, and it's, it's very rare to actually see any form of genuine justice. So with that i think we move into the final part of this story and that is the conclusion and where we are currently at in september 2023 and yes i just realized i haven't uploaded in basically two months i am really sorry some of you thought i was dead by the way i got comments being like is it is he okay is, you know is he in a grave honestly maybe i am in a mental grave after this
So, my brothers, sisters, and thisters, where do we actually go from here on this wonderful story? It's not wonderful, is it? It's a terrible story, but where do we go from here? What happens now? Who happens now? Well, the first thing that you should go and do right now is actually subscribe to this YouTube channel, because, fellas, I've, I've not said it for, like, four hours, and that actually kind of surprises me. Maybe I should have said it in every single beginning of every hour of this video, but please... Please subscribe to me to help for my sanity. But in terms of, you know, uh, this whole entire situation and how this world is now perceiving Colleen Ballinger and everything that's happened in the last few months, because yes, this situation is now around three months old if you're not including everything back in 2020. And honestly, that is absolutely wild. This situation has probably been and will be the biggest situation on YouTube in a very long time. Probably the biggest situation since the last Dramageddon. And I'm fully aware that I'm a 26 year old man that ironically just used the phrase of Dramageddon. I apologize. But in terms of the actual developments with everything to do with Colleen, it seems that things aren't ending. For example, Swoop has got a part four to her documentary series coming out soon, where she has done two interviews with her ex-husband, Joshua Evans, one interview a few weeks back, and an interview which I saw Swoop post about on her Instagram story whilst recording this video. And I feel like that interview is probably going to be heavy about Johnny Silvestri, but I also think given how Colleen Ballinger obviously is so tied to that situation, it's probably not going to look good on her. And naturally, I think because of every single development that happens every single week, I think Colleen Ballinger is laying low. As we've seen what her lawyers have said in the past, they believe that this is a tactic which should be applied in a lot of situations. I think maybe eventually down the line, we will see an apology. And I believe I have actually said this in my previous two videos, but what more can you really expect? There isn't really anything to add after four hours of speaking other than yes, I do think eventually she will come out because this is a million dollar empire which she owns despite how much it has taken a hit in terms of the monetary value of everything I still think that there is some level of value in the Miranda Sings and Colleen Ballinger empire but if there's one thing that I found quite interesting when it comes to the situation in the recent weeks is that top like mainstream creators are even speaking about it and when that happens I feel like a situation is pretty much solidified because for example there was a streamy award thing I think it is literally called the streamies it's where a bunch of your favorite influencers they all get together and there are little jokes told when they're presenting the awards and stuff like that and at this streamies Matt Pat actually mocked Colleen and and to me personally as much as this doesn't feel very significant I think it is quite significant to see creators who don't necessarily dabble in uh, drama even reference this but it was the tragic loss of this one thing that truly hit the creator community the hardest Something whose train unfortunately left the station with one ill-advised 10-minute long video. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Looks like someone knows how to apologize. Now, whilst I never really expected Matt Pat to get involved in this situation, I, I appreciate his opinions and takes and everything. But yeah, this is a, a very surprising thing and honestly a very damning thing on Colleen. But I think when we refer back to the whole Shane Dawson clip that I played much earlier in this video of where he was speaking about how him and Colleen say nasty things behind the scenes, I really wouldn't be shocked if nowadays a lot of content creators have a bad opinion on Colleen and maybe they've had that opinion for a long time and I've just really been willing to share it. Now, of course, I'm not saying Matt Pat is definitely in that category, but given how many people are now speaking about this subject, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. But also, I think this is mainly significant due to the fact that the industry is seemingly now rejecting Colleen Ballinger. I know that may seem like I'm reaching, but for them to be making a joke like this at such a major influence for event like the Streamies, I think it says a lot. I think it shows that it's much more difficult now for Colleen Ballinger to come back in comparison to what it was like three months ago. I think if she comes back in the future, then she'll find it very difficult to get future collaborations and just in general continue the same way she continued her work three months ago in the future of the industry. In terms of other people that have been leaking things and speaking about Killeen and further, Trisha Paytas of course has been speaking about it, but not just Trisha, even people like Tana Mojo have been weighing in here. Here's the thing, I tried to have girlfriends yeah. and I tried it this summer and it just failed miserably. <laughs> it failed miserably. Why? I, she just sent my nudes and said I looked like a fat pig in it. <laughs> oh my god, can I say her name? Yeah. That, you know, yeah. Her so fucking much.
fucking heart, Trisha. And I know you sit there. You look pretty. You be nice because if this goes in, it's going to get clipped. And here's the thing. She is being non-problematic right now. It is me. Who the who does that? I've never been more blindsided. Like, I, I talk about this because we're like, I thought you're not talking about it. I'm like so in shock every single day. Like, how was I so blinded? Why did we start a podcast together when she like and hated it, me? And that is so beyond that. You're just a terrible person. And at your prehistoric age, you. I want to start doing things with you, and, and I won't call you. <laughs> At the end of the day, apologizing for anything with a f instrument is f hilarious. Oh my god, girl, she sent it to me, and I was like, "What do I say?" I the next time I have to apologize, you're seeing me with a harp. <laughs> like I'm gonna be playing the harp. Like just, I'm so sorry that I did this. Now, obviously, there wasn't really anything new added on there. Everything she said was completely valid. But yeah, I think again, it's quite significant to see major mainstream content creators speak about Colleen. But of course, Trisha Paytas is one of the main people who, rightly so, is leaking information and personal things out there about Colleen. I'm not saying that as a, as a dig. Trisha Paytas is a victim in this situation. And in fact, in a recent podcast that Trisha posted, she actually said that uh, Colleen did get in contact with her to apologize, but not apologize for actually doing what she did, but apologize for lying. Well, it was confirmed she sent them. She sent me an apology on that Saturday after I made the video. I made the video July 3rd, and then she sent me an apology on like Saturday, July like 8th or 9th. And she's like, yeah, I was a coward. I lied to you. Like, I should have just told you the truth when you asked me about the photos. Like, I was a coward, and that was it. So she like apologized for it. So she's like, she definitely sent them to that guy. They're not denying that she sent them. Now, I don't think it's really shocking at this point of time that Colleen Ballinger isn't an authentic person or a good friend at that. I know they're not friends anymore, but the, the best that she could do is say, yeah, I am sorry that I sent your explicit photos around, especially to the people that I sent them to. Obviously, it's not good in any case, but this is the worst possible case. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier. I feel like because of these developments, this only came recently, as did the streamies things and everything else that's been coming out over the last few weeks. I think Colleen may not say anything until towards the end of the year. I really would not be shocked if that's the move for her because if she did have anything that could disprove everything in a situation or just one thing in a situation, I think they would have already done that and they have tried to do that. The lawyers, as I showed at the beginning of this video, have come out and spoken about things but it's never changed anything because when it comes to them actually speaking about the major things that Trisha Paytas just spoke about in that clip, which by the way, seemingly does confirm it even further that photos were sent to minors they're not speaking about that because i don't think that they can technically disprove that so i guess they're just going to now lay quiet the lawyers tried their best nothing changed colleen ballinger did her absolute worst and things only got a million times worse but ladies and gentlemen it's not like the things that we're saying about colleen she doesn't know about or she isn't seeing and in fact i feel like it's actually the opposite of that because recently it actually came out that colleen Colleen Ballinger does still have an active social media profile. In fact, she has a, a, a private Instagram. Now, this isn't 100% verifiable, but based on the following, apparently people worked out that this is Colleen because it's apparently followed by family members and stuff like that. And the bio says that she just misses so much. And I imagine, well, yeah, she is probably regretting basically everything of the last 10 years because there is just so much stuff that has happened. And I feel like, yeah, maybe if she could go back now with some hindsight, like she probably wouldn't do absolutely everything. I think if there's one final thing to end this whole thing on is, yes, there won't be a response for a very long time. But secondly, this situation is the prime situation to how you respond to things. I'll say it again. I think I said it in video two and video one. Every single situation on YouTube is about how you respond to stuff. Now, I think if Colleen just put out an authentic apology video where she genuinely seemed apologetic, I don't think it would rectify things given the severity of the stuff in this situation, but I at least think that the situation by now would have died down. But the fact of the matter is, it hasn't died down. If anything, it's still continuously getting worse and worse. And in fact, I am seeing people now call out Colleen's silence, and that is only adding to 
the flames. To try and come to some form of conclusion in this situation, it's pretty difficult to say anything other than this situation is one of the messiest, most disturbing things that I have ever seen, and I didn't expect the community that she had cultivated to be this absolutely wild. And don't take that as an offense if you were once in the Colleen Ballinger community. You were a child, you know, you, you do know better, but it's wild to think that basically every single adult in the story has, has done something wrong. I, I, I don't understand how that happened for so long and why it was allowed, but I guess it, it's something that we can take and learn from this. We can learn to analyze patterns of behavior from certain influences and famous people because it seems we haven't done that with all the other situations. So maybe, just maybe, ladies and gentlemen, we should do that with this situation. Overall, Colleen, I think your best bet is to just to upload an actual YouTube video because you know you, you are a YouTuber. That is what you do. Don't do a, a shitty little notes up apology like Johnny Silvestri. Do an actual video, the thing you're known for, and just say sorry. Apologize to the victims involved. And if you want to continue to upload videos, that's not for me to decide if you should be deplatformed or not. It, it, do do what you want. I, I think you just need to apologize to the victims at this point. So, yeah, I'm going to end it there by just wishing nothing but my best wishes to the victims in this situation. And I hope that things are not as stressful as they were a few months ago, because I can imagine when the situation was fully blowing up, it was absolutely horrible. But, yeah, I guess that is finally... The end. Okay, I feel like I firstly should start this part off, seeing as this is the ending part, this is no script, this is just me being me, unfortunately, but I will start this by saying, could you please all do me a favour and go down below and comment, thank you, Jacket, because she edited this video, obviously I did my part of the editing, but she did all the main sparkly, actual difficult bits, and yeah, just, just go comment, thank you, Jacket, and then also, please, go follow Jacket on social media, Jacket, you literally, I know you're editing, you're saying, uh, hello, how you doing? Put your social media right here. Don't put a random photo. In fact, if, if they're putting a photo over here right now, go and tweet them that photo, all right? Do that, and when you've done that, when you've sent her that, I don't know, um, subscribe. Basically, I'm just trying to be grateful, but I also should just say thank you to Swoop and Legal Bites for all the content that I have used in this video. I try to not use, like, too much, obviously. I needed to use their points to, to kind of make my points be backed even further and explain certain parts of the situation, but, you know, I, 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 I feel like I used a fair amount. I just would, thought I'd say thank you to them in particular. Please go subscribe to them and watch their videos. The links will be in the description to their channels. But ultimately, if you've watched all three parts of this video, videos, you are absolutely mental. Thank you so much. I genuinely appreciate it more than you know. Like, seriously, I don't understand how people watch 20 minutes of me sometimes. So, three and a half hours, nine hours, maybe more. Oh my god. A lot of... A lot of hours. It, I don't know how you guys do it, but ultimately, thank you very much. And if you want more, please subscribe and comment your thoughts down below and give me opinions on pretty much everything in the description. I would appreciate it very, very much. And if you want to do me a big favor as well, please could you go follow me on Instagram at iNabba. It's just there in the description. I'm not going to promote any other socials other than that. I really have been using Instagram quite a lot recently. And if you've been wondering where I've been gone for the last two months, I post on my Instagram every single day. So if you want little updates of me, it's there in the description. I Nabba, please go and follow that. But yeah, I also won't be leaving again for another month or two. It's just because it's it's been a stressful time, but also this video has taken ages to do with new things and new things and new things. So thank you very much for your patience. I apologize for getting dates wrong and being like, I'm going to upload on this day and I don't actually upload and you guys think I'm dead. I'm sorry for that. It won't happen again. Well, it probably will happen again, but I'll try my best to not do it too often. And yeah, I will see you in a new video probably within the next week. Thank you very much. Have an amazing week, weekend, whenever you're watching this. Take it easy and peace out.